Cornell. I make a living doing economic theory, uh, which may make me in not quite unique, but certainly I'm a member of an increasingly rare species. And I know that for most of you in this room, theory is one of those requirements that you have to get to before you can get to the stuff that you really want to do in life. Right? So I want to take two minutes at the very beginning to explain why all of you really need to be concerned about economic theory, although not necessarily every page in Moscow, L. Winston, and Green. Thank God, right? <laughs> so uh, the reason for that is that all of you uh, really are going to be theorists. So imagine you do some empirical work, you do a study, and at the end of the day, you come up, you have some data set, and you have uh, um, some statistical thing that you do. You push the button uh, on uh, you know, R or Stata or um, whatever you're using. Uh, and at the end of the day, you have some uh, coefficient uh, estimates, right? Um, and uh, good, so now what you've done is you've said something about the data set that you have, uh, that you have examined, okay? Here's a relationship that you can see in the data set that you've examined. But of course, you're not gonna stop there. Right? You're going to go on and make some claims to the fact that this is actually important, that this is generalizable, that it says something about the world beyond the data set right, that you have in front of you. Right? And every time you do that, you know, you're, what are you doing? You're saying, well, this isn't just some, some arbitrary correlation that popped up. Right? This really has meaning. Right? It has significance. And why does it have significance? Right? Why is it not just a correlation? So you'll come up with some explanation. And that explanation will be a bunch of theoretical claims. Okay? And so you will be doing theory when you offer that explanation, when you explain why your coefficients are, why your estimates are causal and not just uh, correlations that happen to appear in this particular data set. Um, now, the difficulty, I think, with, with um, the way that much empirical work is presented is that discussion about that aspect of the, uh, um, uh, of the research program um, can be, um, is oftentimes very attenuated in seminars, right? Um, it is, uh, doesn't play a large role in the publication. Um, there'll be some discussion, for example, of why such and such is a, uh, is a good instrument, okay? Well, if you think about it, actually making a claim that a variable is a, is a useful instrument for the model that you are, you know, that you are, that you are using is in fact, um, um, uh, in, that involves a bunch of theoretical claims. And so let me, let me give you a quick example. Um, some years ago, it was popular to do, um, uh, to do growth regressions um, where one of the variables was something called trust. So how, do you, how many of you have ever seen any of these studies? Right? So there's something called the World Value Survey, ringing a bell. Okay? And in the World Value Survey, there is a trust question. Okay? And I don't remember exactly how the trust question goes. Maybe some of you, one, someone in here has used it and remembers exactly. The, uh, basically, there is a statement that says, generally speaking, I trust people. Something like this, right? And then you are asked to um, assess your degree of belief in this statement or your degree of confidence in this statement um, uh, uh, going from, uh, you know, from 1 to 10 or 0 to 10 maybe on a scale, okay? Um, and that is the, that, that 0 to 10 scale, that ordinal number, that is that ordinal representation of confidence, that is the, is the trust variable. So now you're going to stick this into uh, a regression. Well, the problem is, is that, is that, uh, um, uh, people say, well, gee, this, you know, this variable is really, um, we want to use it to talk about the importance of social capital. Okay? And social capital is something that we are going to uh, touch on a bit later today. So, fine, we're going to use this to talk about social capital, so we have this trust variable. But, of course, you know, it's really kind of endogenous, isn't it? Because success breeds trust, right? If things work out, then I am going to trust you more in the future. So, gee, we need an instrument for it. Right? Uh, so a, uh, a, a common thing to do uh, would be to look for something that you think might be correlated with trust. Um, and a good example, so there's one paper I know of that actually used the degree of linguistic cohesiveness of a country. Okay? What percentage of people had a, uh, um, a common native, a, a common mother tongue? I, th I think that was the, the variable that was used. And the idea here, I mean, it's not stupid to imagine that this might be correlated with trust because if we have generalized trust, because if we are part of a linguistic community, then probably 
that is correlated with being in part of a broader community that identifies itself as such, and we would expect this to be connected with trust in some way. It seems plausible, right? Okay. But on the other hand, um, you know, to be a to be a good instrument, um, you need to be uh, you need to have two properties, right? And at least in a linear model. And I'm the last person here to be talking about econometrics. Chris is getting worried about now up there. Um, uh, you know, one of course is that you want to be correlated with the variable that you're instrumenting for, and the other thing is that you don't want to be correlated with the error term, right? So let's think about this for a moment. Um, uh, uh, the theory that we have in front of us that says that uh, this trust variable and a bunch of other things determine, and, you know, determine economic growth rates, um, this is really not a complete theory, right? There's a lot of things that are involved in explaining economic growth, and this is only one piece of it that we're looking at. Um, lots of things that we look at in economics are, in fact, multi-causal, and we're only looking at one piece, right? So suppose that I had a theory that said that linguistic cohesiveness was actually important for economic growth, right? And you could imagine such a theory easily. In fact, such theories have actually been constructed. Well, where do those theories, how are they represented, right, in, in this trust regression that you're running, right? Well, the, these other causal factors that you're not measuring, they're in the error term, right? So to say that this is part of another theory is really to say that it's correlated with the error term, so how could it be a good instrument, right? But in order to figure that out, we needed theoretical models. And that is, that is my point, okay? That you need to be aware of the, of the model that you are implicitly using. Um, and sometimes it even makes sense. You might never present it, but it is oftentimes, I think, and I've seen this in working with a number of empirical students, empirically minded students, just write down the equation system that you have in mind or turn it into an equation system so that we can just look at the story. And then it's remarkable what, what, what pops up when you do that. Um, may never be part of your presentation, just might help you improve your verbal explanation. But the point is, is that there are a bunch of theoretical claims here and we need to be, it, that, that we use all the time in order to say that our, our, our empirical results are meaningful. Um, and so you should all be aware that when you're saying that your results are meaningful, you are actually being theorists. And therefore, if you're gonna be theorists, you might as well be good theorists rather than bad theorists. So um, this is the, uh, um, uh, why I think this stuff is, uh, is important. And, um, uh, and, and in particular, there are, there, are, there are important things that you worry about where theory and econometrics really meet. So for example, identification, right, is very much where, where, where theory and econometrics actually meet. Okay, so, um, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later today. All right, so let's move on and get into what we want to talk, or what I want to talk about today, maybe what you want to hear today, um, having to do with uh, social networks. So, the study of social networks in economics is actually a piece of a larger research program having to do with the relationship between um, economic life and uh, other social life or larger social life, broader social life. Um, so uh, economics, um, uh, you know, economics and sociology and psychology are all separate disciplines today. Um, there is some crosstalk between some segment of the psychology community and some segment of the economics community in the area of behavioral economics. There is much less crosstalk, I think, between sociologists and economics. Um, and, uh, uh, but there is, of course, some. Uh, but all of these, all of these um, uh, disciplines have their roots right, in, in a uh, common uh, enterprise of trying to understand social life. And if you go back and, for example, uh, we talked about this a little bit at dinner last night, you recall, if you go back and you read Adam Smith, right, you will find in um, Adam Smith discussions of, of social stuff, right, which is not exactly economics. You'll find discussions about how people think and reason and stuff. So this is all really, really of a piece. And of course, we understand Adam Smith, of course, was the first to tell us about the virtues of specialization, right? And, uh, um, and now we have these, these silos. Um, and I am here to convince you today um, that uh, the sociology economic silo is a uh, silo, or these are two silos that maybe um, should be breached, or maybe there's a wall here that I don't know, I'm ruining the metaphor, but uh, you get the idea. Okay, uh, so uh, here, are, here are, 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 are two views of, um, of uh, uh, social life. 
Uh, and you've now, by now, I did all this chat, so you could actually have chance to read these, uh, a chance to read these um, uh, quotations. The first is from a book by Carl Polanyi called The Great Transformation. And the, uh, uh, the second is, um, uh, 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 comes from an NBER conference um, uh, back in, in, uh, in 1960. Now, The Great Transformation um, argues that, uh, that market society uh, by which Polanyi means that the uh, combination of the market economy and the nation state, this actually arose in the 18th, 19th, 20th century, late 18th, 19th, and 20th century. And in so doing, it changed the way that uh, people think about things. It changed people's internal calculus. Um, Pre-transformation economies, according to Polanyi, were based on a social order built on reciprocity and redistribution, and not, he claims, on the harnessing of self-interested behavior. Right. The rational man, according to Polanyi, evolved coincident coincidentally with the market economy. Now, I, I'm not sure that I believe this, okay, but many people do, right? This is one, I, I think we could call Karl Polanyi a sociologist. He certainly wasn't an economist to write that, right? Um, and so this is one view of, um, of uh, uh, rational choice, for instance, and the role of rational choice in society, which is very different from the role that we have. Um, uh, the economics view of sociology is much more pithily stated by Jim Dusenberry. Economics is all about how people make choices. Sociology is all about why they don't have any choices to make. Okay. Um, and, uh, um, and I want to claim that, uh, uh, that there is a, 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 a middle ground, which is uh, very useful um, to, uh, uh, to study. So there is a, a, a literature today which many people refer to by the very awkward and unfortunate phrase, social interactions. Right? It brings up all kinds of images. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and this idea of looking at, at, at the effects of social organization on economic outcomes uh, is um, important in a number of different uh, areas. And so here I, 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 I prepared a quick list. Here was just off the top of my head a number of um, uh, areas in which uh, I can think of papers where social considerations play um, an important role, or, or reason, you know, areas of research where social considerations play a role. Um, labor markets, uh, there are a number of papers. We're going to be talking later today about some papers that, that look at, uh, for example, the effects of social structure on job search. Right? Uh, uh, fertility, um, there have been uh, uh, a number of papers, some by economists and some actually by rational choice sociologists, uh, having to do with fertility decisions and, um, and, and peer effects there. Health, obviously, educational outcomes, you know that there's a large literature on peer effects in education. Okay, um, and uh, 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 violence, we talk about the contagion of violence, right? And um, again, there's a, there's a literature here. On the right side, I've listed a number of mechanisms, several mechanisms, um, uh, peer effects, uh, you know, all kinds of, of, of things having to do with stigma or, or, or getting social rewards from one's peers. Uh, these are at work. Um, a role model, uh, um, uh, mechanisms. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later on. Uh, we, you know, there's a large literature, as you know, on social norms and the effect of social norms on on, on economic outcomes. Uh, social learning, right? This is very popular in in the number of papers in development economics having to do with social learning. We'll be talking about one at least one of those later today. I put a question mark after social capital only because people argue about what social capital means. Um, and so it's a little um, a lot suspect to put it as a, as a mechanism, uh, listed as a mechanism, when I can't actually, or at least there's no agreed upon description of what that mechanism is. Actually, some people would say that social capital is nothing more than the list of everything preceding it. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, perhaps that's true. Now, what kinds of questions um, uh, do people ask, okay? And how do they ask them, okay? Um, so um, uh, let me start with the second question first. How does one study social interactions? Um, and uh, of course, we know, what, what do we do? We go out and we estimate models. So we'll write down a model where my choices somehow depend upon the choices that you make, right? Yes. Buggy about this because you said you didn't like the term, but, but you kept using it anyway. 
So I still get, so what is not a social, it might be more useful to understand what a social interaction is not. Is, I mean, any time, it's at some level, any time two people are in, two or more people are in a room together, that's a social interaction. Yes. Right. right, including a regular market transaction is some sort of social interaction. Yeah, well, well, that's that's right, and 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 maybe one way to, to think about it is that um, uh, anonymous market exchange, as we conceive it, right, is clearly not a social interaction. Right, what we've actually done is stripped away all of these. Uh, maybe a better way to put this is the following: that we have stripped away in the work that we do um, all of the social structure or a lot of social structure, so that if I want to study contracting with you, right? I might not, I might think about, well, what are the contracts? As an economist, I might think about, well, what, does, what are the terms of the contract, right? And what is an equilibrium contract going to, th going to be? And I'm going to neglect the fact that you are my first cousin once removed, and we have this extended family, and we have this repeated interaction going on, right? So, so um, I, I guess the way I think about this is actually maybe leans in the direction that you're, that, 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 that you're bringing up, that, every, that, that there is this larger, mesh of life in which everything is in, you know, in which uh, um, uh, economic transactions are, are only one piece. And what we do is actually just carve that out and try and strip away that structure. And we all understand the importance and the power of that research methodology, right? I mean, by, it's only, you know, people complain about reductionism in the social sciences, right? There are conferences that talk about this. But in fact, if you're not a reductionist, all you can do is say, yeah, the world's a very complicated place, right? All this stuff is going on, wow. Right? Um, you need to, to strip away stuff. And what we've done is, is stripped away all of the social structure from the interactions that we actually look at, or at least that's the paradigm. But now, of course, what we're doing is coming back and saying, well, maybe some of these other things are important. Right? Who is in the classroom, Who is in the classroom with you? That is important. Um, uh, and and uh, um, so I, I think that, this, uh, that, that this, this clean break between, uh, there's not really any such thing as a clean break between economics and uh, economic and other social, and, and, and social interactions per se. It's just, it's just maybe putting um, emphasis on different explanatory variables. How's that? It, what it, so if I buy something on Amazon, I guess, there's right. no social interaction. If I buy something, so the argument is that if I buy something at Walmart, if anything that I do would be different because I'm buying at Walmart rather than buying on, on Amazon, that that kind of thing you would call social interaction. Is that it? That I, 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 I suppose that that's right, but I would, of course, would expect that there's not much difference between shopping at Walmart and shopping. Well, actually, of course, actually, that's not true because um, there's a difference between buying something at Amazon where you pretty much know what you're looking at. Well, I'm, I'm now making claims about a user experience, right? But when I buy something on Amazon, I typically, it's hard to browse Amazon, right? But it's easy to browse the shelves of Walmart, right? So if I want to, if I want to buy a TV, right, um, I might go to Walmart or Best Buy or something like that and look at a whole bunch of TV screens, right? Uh, on the other hand, when I buy at Amazon, right, I just say, well, all right, here's what I want, and I go and I type it in, and I get a list of three products, and I choose one, and I hit the button. So they are different experiences, but they don't differ in terms of social interactions. Right, but um, actually, there is, there are social interaction components to Amazon because right, Amazon has lots of reviews, and if you get involved in the reviewing community, right, and or on the other hand, if as a user you read reviews, how many of you buy things on Amazon, right, and how many of you actually read product reviews on Amazon, okay, right, so that is that so so. Think about what you're doing there. Now you're you're you're, you're you have mechanisms for evaluating trust, right? Um, uh, for, for, well, for, for, I'm sorry, not evaluating trust, but for deciding whether or not you trust the reviews that you read, right? And, 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 um, and if you buy things repeatedly, so I buy a lot of music, right? Um, and I buy classical music. And so if you go on Amazon, right, there are reviewers who are very knowledgeable and reviewers that are, are, are not knowledgeable. And I buy, I have to say, I'm embarrassed to say that I buy enough music that I know the usernames of some of the more knowledgeable users. So I you know, go to their reviews. Now that's a social interaction, right? Okay. So, so this is pretty vague. How's that? So I asked you what's not a social interaction. It said Amazon, and you said no. No, nah, but now I say yes, it is, right. Well, there, there is this component. Here's something more concrete. So if, suppose that like, peer effects in a classroom. Mm -hmm. So I can think about different, I mean, here's two different mechanisms through which they work. One is that peers interact with each other, and we learn stuff from each other. Right. So that's a social interaction. Another mm -hmm. one is I'm a teacher, and I have heterogeneity in the students in the class, 
If I'm somewhere in the bottom, I pitch the class to the top, so the fact that these top guys are in there are gonna hurt me. So that's another form of peer effect. Mm -hmm. Would you call that a social interaction, though? Um, yeah, I guess, I, well, I would call it, yes, it's a social effect that you have to worry about, right? So I, I you know, I, I, I wanna be careful about this. Uh, that is not a, I guess I wouldn't say that that's a social interaction in the, that's just an effect of heterogeneity, right? Uh, but on the other hand, if I want to estimate pure effects, right, I want to separate, I, I would want to worry about that. If I were doing the, the canonical pure effects um, estimation, right, um, uh, I, would, uh, uh, I would actually want to worry about that effect, right, somehow and control for it in some way. So I guess I think that, that um, um, it's kind of hard to draw a line between what kinds of interactions between individuals are social interactions and, and as, as, the, as the literature talks about them and, and what aren't, right? Because many of the things that the literature doesn't talk about are things that it should be worried about. Right. This, is a, this literature, I think, is pretty underdeveloped and, 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 and yet has great promise, which is why I'm talking about it. So what, I, I want to, so I, I, what I'm largely going to talk about today is going to have to do with peer effects, right? with, the, with the effects of, 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 of things like stigma, right? the effect of things. What, I don't know what the, what the antonym of stigma is. Anybody have a suggestion? No, we're all struggling here. Okay, no, no, no English majors in this room. Um, uh, I, so I want to think about 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 that. I also want to think about about what it is that establishes and maintains social norms. Okay, this is really the domain that I want to talk about, right? Um, um, and 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 the fact that we bump into other people and how we relate in other ways um, is something that I'm that is I'm going to exclude. Okay. Um, uh, so I, I, I guess I want to say the following, that, um, uh, that the fact that you and I are transacting and yet we also have a repeated uh, relationship because we're family members and that might play a role, um, that is something that's oftentimes important for economics. That's not something that I'm going to talk about today. Right? On the other hand, there is a literature that talks about that, and it uses the same kinds of methodology and relies a lot on, 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 on readings of culture. Right? So for example, uh, family effects um, in different cultures work different ways. And this is, there's, you know, uh, who's the guy at San Diego who studies this? He's, he's an econometrician, so you must know him. Um, Jim, I can see him in my mind's eye, but I can't remember his name, so let's move on. Uh, I'm over 60, I can do this. Yes. <laughs> where do you see this social interaction literature? With the, uh, where do you see this social interaction literature together with the behavioral literature? Because for me, behavioral economics is basically something that we don't have in the, our standard utility function, and we, we find out about it. And this well, is something that you say that is also another explanatory variable that we haven't looked at before. So you want me to distinguish the study of pure you effects and things this, like this from this behavioral system? economics? Yeah, is it part of it, or how do you see it? Uh, I think that, that, that sociolo econo uh, sociologists of, of social science, sociologists of economics, can worry about whether it's part of it or not, right? Um, I, I guess I, I, uh, um, uh, I would say that, um, that um, this is not something that I really want to get into because I don't want to get into my views on behavioral economics, okay? Um, uh, but let me put it this way. If you're worried about things like, like cumulative, uh, um, uh, you know, cumulative prospect theory or loss aversion or things like that, right, that doesn't have much anything to do with what I'm talking about, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, and, and, you know, there is one view of... Uh, of behavioral economics. Ariel Rubinstein said basically that, uh, um, that behavioral economics, the way it's practiced today, is nothing more than a different utility function. Okay? Um, if you buy that view, um, uh, I have to say that I largely buy that view, although I recognize that typical Ariel fashion, it's a little bit uncharitable. Um, uh, if, 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 you, if, you, if you buy that view, this is really, um, 
this is, uh, the study of pure effects, I think, is really something that is uh, um, a distinct thing, right? One can study pure effects, for example, within the confines of, of, uh, of standard game theory, Nash equilibrium, right? So if you think that behavioral economics is all about um, having funny preferences and stuff like that, I would say no. If you think that behavioral economics is really nothing more than expanding traditional economic calculations to include other social structure, um, uh, I would say yes it is, but I also think that's a bad definition of behavioral economics. All right, so I, I think it's a road not worth kind of going down. Right? Uh, there are certainly, certainly uh, by the way, there are, there are a number of behavioral economists who, who think about social structure in laboratory settings. Right? It's, it's a little hard to do for obvious reasons, right? but, but um, uh, I, you know, behavioral economists certainly read um, this literature uh, or these literatures. They, behavioral economists certainly worry about social norms. They worry about peer effects. They worry about things like role models and stuff like this. Right? Um, so you know, at the end of the day, we're all good economists right? looking for good problems. So, Chris, I haven't, really, I haven't really helped you here very much, except I would, I'm going to say that, that largely what I am interested in right, is, 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 is the effects of social networks and network structure, social network structure on economic outcomes. Right? Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today, and that is pretty well defined. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to get back to the question again about the social capital. So um, I want to offer one hypothetical question that I I'm not sure it's That that's a little broad, right? Don't you think? Because I think it defines a lot of things. Like when you are making a purchase online, if you read the review, that form of kind of trust, mm -hmm. or so I. I Right. So let me say that I, I, I know of people who will buy that as a definition of social capital. I think it's actually not a useful social defini a definition of social capital, largely because it doesn't really make any distinctions. Right? We wanna, you wanna, what we want to do with defining concepts is do exactly what Chris did. We want to say what's in it, what's not in it. Okay? And, that, and that is hard to do with a definition that is that broad. Right. So, so, for example, there's a sociologist, Nan Lin, who has uh, um, a definition of, of social capital, which is the, the, um, um, the um, which I like, okay? um, and it, it, it comes nearest to satisfying me of all the definitions that are out there. Um, I actually have a slide on this, which I took out of the talk, because I really don't want to talk about social capital. Uh, but, the, uh, uh, but his definition is that, is, that, is, that, is that if we think about social capital, number one, is embodied in social networks. Okay? And it is that part of the, of the social, it is that part of what in, econo uh, what in networks that affects outcomes that is embodied in the edges of the network rather than in the nodes. So the nodes, right, um, and this is a rather bad rewording of what he wrote. I can give you a citation and you can and find it later. So the nodes, right, are the, are the characteristics of the individuals, right? So when, when uh, um, these are the attributes that we as individuals have, right? The relational attributes are what's embodied in the edges, right? And we can think maybe of a list of attributes if we were kind of trying to do some study and we were to write down a bunch of attributes that were going to go into our regression or something like that, we would have node variables and we would have edge variables. And he would say that the edge variables, that's what he means by social capital, right? So that is well defined, right? But it's also a lot narrower than, than what you described, okay? Um, let me move on uh, uh, because what I want to do very quickly um, you've already now internalized everything. Uh, uh, there are lots of papers out there that actually estimate pure effects using conventional econometric techniques. Um, I call these traditional economic tools. Um, uh, it's interesting to read how uh, other social science literatures uh, look at the effects of social networks, peer effects, things like this. Um, uh, there are uh, 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 field experiments that used to be popular, less so now, but used to be popular in social psychology, um, uh, where uh, uh, you, you, you take groups of people in the wild, so to speak, um, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, 
uh, and, and apply treatments to them in different ways. So there was, uh, for example, a, 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 a famous experiment called the Robber's Cave Experiment. And so what some guys in Oklahoma did was to take a bunch of boys um, in, out into a state park and divided them into two groups. And, um, and these guys largely didn't know each other and you had uh, group A and group B and so they had a little bit of interaction first and then they were separated. And then the, uh, the experimenters started, you know, down talking the other group, right? They were, you know, those group B guys, they're, you know, they're really no good. You guys do everything much better. And what they did was they built up enmity and very quickly, right, uh, this enmity built up and then things became very competitive. And then, they, uh, um, and then they tore it down by finding a cooperative task, giving them a problem that could only be solved if the two groups worked together. And they wanted to see how, the point of this was to see how malleable these kinds of social relations, social views were. And their conclusion was that it was pretty malleable. And I don't, and I, would love to talk more about this experiment, but this is really an over lunch or better an over beer conversation because it has a lot to do with uh, how one should actually conduct research. Um, and, uh, but experiments like that were done all the time and they're very interesting to read and have motivated a lot of thinking about things. Ethnographies, um, uh, again, are also understanding that um, how, for example, social networks works depends upon, it, it, it depends upon a lot of things, right? And, and, and certainly social networks work different ways in, social, in different cultures, okay? Um, and so understanding how things work in situ, um, this is what ethnographies are largely about. Um, uh, I'm not recommending that any of you become ethnographers, but I am suggesting that if you want to work on uh, social networks, if you want to work on, on, on peer effects or the effects of identity, okay, you know, there is this literature, Ackerloff and, and, um, and Rachel Cranton have written a book on identity economics, right? If you want to talk, read, if you want to, if you want to think about these things, you shouldn't just, you shouldn't, it would be a big mistake to read about only what economists write on this, right? Um, and, and, and reading ethnographies, I think, is, is a very useful thing to do. Um, very different way of addressing things. Um, um, I'm just going to move on quickly because I have spent too much time with this introductory material. Um, here's a long list of things, many of which we are not going to talk about. Um, my goal is to talk about matching and to get that far, but I have actually never made it in all the years that I've given these lectures. So um, we'll see if I can make it today. Um, let me just move on. Um, so I'm going to begin by, 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 well, actually, let's go back here. First, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about just networks. How do we describe networks? Okay, how do we describe social networks? So there is a language for this. The language comes from graph theory. So I'm going to familiarize you with this language uh, to some degree. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about what social networks look like and why we might care about social networks. And then I'm going to turn to economic applications. I'm going to talk about, about, uh, about labor markets and job search. Um, I'm going to uh, say something about, um, um, about uh, estimation of social network models. Okay? Um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about, um, uh, I'm going to touch base with some of the stuff that Scott talked about yesterday uh, by talking about matching. Okay, um, and uh, uh, that's my goal. All right, so let me, let me, let me get going. Um, matching has to do with a, a, the broader topic of network formation, where do social networks come from, right? So it is very common, I'll just say this briefly right now, that it is very common um, to estimate a social network now by saying that there is some matrix that represents um, the, different, uh, the different social interactions that can happen or who people are connected to, who they are influenced by, right? Um, and, then, uh, and, then, and then with that, one then adds in some variables and then estimates something. And now the question is, where does that matrix come from? There's a lot of concern that that social network is itself endogenous um, uh, in that our, the network and the things that we do with the network right, are in fact, they, they co-evolve, right? And if that's true, taking the matrix as exogenous is a bit of a problem, right? So um, um, uh, there's much, um, a, a lot of research, uh, recent research, which is concerned with both the, the theory and the econometrics of network formation. Um, and I'll talk a bit about the theory, but not about the, uh, not about the um, uh, uh, econometrics. Um, so let's jump into graph theory, and I'm going to be quick here. Um, I want to say that, that rather than focus on a few papers in depth, um, 
what I'm going to do is mention um, a number of different papers. There's a very extensive reading list um, um, at, the, uh, uh, at the back. It's not the most recent stuff, but it's stuff that is important background um, um, that is worth reading. Uh, if I had to choose one book to read um, to study uh, social networks, I would begin with the um, uh, Easley and Kleinberg book called Networks, Crowds, and Markets. Um, I like this book because Easley and Kleinberg are two co-authors of mine. Um, but uh, more importantly, I think it's a really good book. Right? Uh, also, the book is free. Uh, you can find it on both their websites. Uh, and, uh, but if you want hard copy, it's from Cambridge University Press. If I were to buy a second book, um, uh, it might be Matt Jackson's book. And if I were to buy a third book, but it's a close tie, um, actually Jackson wins largely because he's newer. If I were to buy a third book, it would be Sanjeev Goyal's book. And, uh, uh, and Sanjeev was a student of David's and mine, uh, of Easley's and mine. So um, we're all kind of connected, right? Social network. All right. Um, graphs. Uh, uh, how do we describe a graph? We have a bunch of vertices. We have a set V, vertices or nodes. For a social network, these are going to be the people. We have a bunch of edges. Um, and an edge is just an ordered pair. So um, uh, uh, Chris and I know each other. So in the social networks of, econo of, 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 uh, of economists, uh, I am a vertex. Chris is a vertex. And there is a uh, Chris-Larry pair, right? That's an edge. Okay. Networks can be of two kinds. They can be directed or undirected. Uh, uh, a directed network uh, has an arrow when we represent it, as you can see on the, in the graph on the right. Um, and uh, if I wanted to talk about influence, okay, um, I would want to build a directed network. I would want, because who influences whom? I influence you. You influence me maybe a little less or maybe a little more. We'll see by the end of today, right? I, I like a, a good example for thinking about a number of problems in social networks is to think about what I call the Oprah network, right? How many of you know who Oprah is? Almost, well, actually not so many of you. Okay, maybe some of you are just embarrassed to admit that you used to watch that show. Okay, so, uh, so I, I think of this as a, a, a network with a lot of vertices and there's one person called Oprah and all these edges that point to her, right? Because she influences a lot of people. Now, she isn't really influenced very much by any one, but she is certainly influenced by the aggregate of her viewership, right? And so she influences me maybe with weight one, and uh, I influence her with weight one over n, where n is a very large number, right, corresponding to the number of viewers that she has. Um, so, um, um, uh, and now what I've just done is, inf is, is introduced uh, a more complicated concept, a weighted network, and we'll come back and talk about that in just a moment. So a network is a, a directed graph, which is a collection of, um, of uh, uh, nodes and edges. Um, uh, if, actually, if we're talking about a directed graph, the edges are ordered. If we're talking about an undirected graph, the edges are not ordered. It's just a pair. It's just a list. And, uh, um, and that's a pretty, um, uh, pretty straightforward concept. The degree of a node, the words in red are, words, are, are common vocabulary words that people throw around when they write about social networks. The degree in an undirected graph is the um, number of edges that come from a, divin, a given node. A degree is a property of a node. So the degree of a node is the number of edges that have, that connect to that node directly, okay? Um, the, um, uh, when we talk about directed networks, degree is a more complicated concept. We talk about the in degree, the number of edges that point to me, and we talk about out degree, the number of edges that come from me to other people. Um, I'm largely not going to talk about directed edges, uh, directed graphs today, because um, it's just easier to talk about undirected graphs. Okay? Uh, I guess I'll make a few references as time goes on. Um, so you get the idea from looking at the pictures here that the degree of C is 1, um, and uh, uh, the degree of B is 2. Okay, in uh, the graph on the left. A path is an ordered list of nodes uh, 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 that uh, connect to each other. So C, B, D is, uh, is a path. There's a C, B edge, and then there's a B, D edge. And so there's a way of traversing the graph um, to get from C to D. Um, 
Uh, now, actually, there are multiple ways of getting from C to D, because I could go from C to A to B to D, right? Or I could go from C to B to back to C, back to B, and then up to D, right? So there are all kinds of paths here, all right? And uh, the shortest path between two nodes um, is called a geodesic. Right? Just like thinking about, you know, uh, on, on, on the globe, right? The geodesic is the shortest path between two points. Airplanes are allegedly claimed to fly geodesics, although they really don't, um, uh, in order to economize on fuel. All right. Um, a subset of vertices is connected if there's a path between any two of them, and a component is just a set of vertices which is connected and maximal with respect to the property of being connectedness, of being connected. So here, are, here is a graph um, which, has, um, which has two components. The component on the right is a clique. What does it mean to be a clique? Everything is connected to everything else. Many, many economic models that have been estimated um, uh, a lot of the pure effect models, for instance, basically assume that a classroom is a clique, that everybody is influenced by uh, everybody else in the classroom, right? Um, there is an uh, important paper in Econometrica by um, uh, Sacerdote, Carroll, and West. Not in that order. I think it's alphabetical order. Carroll, Sacerdote, and West. Um, where um, uh, it is observed um, that, uh, in fact, networks are often not cliques, right? Um, this is a fascinating study having to do, it looked at peer effects in education. Um, uh, data from the Air Force Academy, uh, the question that they asked was, how can we, uh, uh, the Air Force Academy d d divides its students into companies. Uh, and uh, in the military sense of the word company, right? Not a corporate sense of company. Uh, and, uh, and then these companies do things together and they take classes together and stuff like this. And so um, um, these guys had the idea that, that you know, the, 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 the companies, the cliques, could be organized in such a way, the characteristics of individuals could be mixed in such a way so as to optimize for educational outcomes, right? Uh, if we put the right people together in the right way. And so they did some work and they figured out how to do this and then they assembled these companies. These companies were then assembled according to their recommendations and the whole thing just failed, right? Typical policy outcome, right? We make our recommendation, it's wrong. Why is it wrong, right? It's wrong because in fact there's a lot of social structure which is internal to right, the company, um, and the, uh, um, and in fact, the network is endogenous, right, and determined by, you know, who you're with in the company that, you know, essentially maybe it defines a feasible, um, the feasible set of edges, um, but in fact, people construct their own networks inside, and the paper in Econometrica is the discussion of, um, of that exactly, and, and therefore the importance of worrying about the endogeneity of networks. Um, how do we represent, uh, graphs in a useful way. Well, you know, it's nice to draw pictures, but it's hard to do anything with a picture except show it, okay? Um, so for analytical purposes, we can, there's a number of different kinds of graphs that people use. There are people talk about graph Laplacians, for instance. Um, we're gonna largely talk about things called adjacency matrix, sometimes also called social matrices. Um, and uh, uh, there is a, um, a one in row I, column J, if there is an edge from I to J, okay? An arrow from I to J, and if the graph is an undirected graph, this will be a symmetric matrix, because if it's undirected, and there's an edge from I to J, then there's an edge from J to I. In a directed graph, of course, this need not be, typically won't be symmetric, yes? Good question. Um, in this particular setup, we don't allow for uh, sometimes having and sometimes don't having the edge. So, for instance, thinking of having instead of a 1 and 0 0.5 as the probability of having an edge. All right, so, so um, uh, the next step would be to talk about weighted adjacency matrices. So, for instance, a common, a common pure effect model that has been often estimated, uh, I think first estimated as far as I know, well, I was about to say Linda Datcher, but I think there's an earlier paper by Wallace Oates and another co-author that I can't recall at the moment. Um, I mean, that was actually back in the 70s and Linda Datcher did this in the 80s. Um, is a model called the linear and means model, right? How many of you have heard of the so-called linear and means model? Anybody? Right? I mean, people estimate it still today all the time, 
right? Um, so the linear and means model simply says that, that, that I, am, I am influenced by the average of the behavior of everybody else. And we'll look at, at, at some examples of this later on, right? So if that's the case, right, um, then I'm, and I have a lot of friends, then the influence of each one friend is going to be kind of small. And if I have only a few friends, on the other hand, the influence would be large. How would we represent that? Um, what we would do is we would replace um, uh, uh, we would we would replace this with a matrix where the row sums were all one, right? And we would put equal weight on on all on all non-zero elements. I'm sorry, all non-zero elements in any row. So the first row would be one half, one half. The second, oh, zero, one half, one half, and then zero on out. Um, the uh, one, two, um, one, two, three, four. The fifth row would be zeros until you get to the last three elements, they would each be one third, and so on and so forth. But you bring up another important point, um, and that is that, um, you know, we act as if these things are static, right? So we have a, a classroom, we have data for a year in that classroom, and we say, fine, here is the, is the, is the, uh, um, the matrix representation of the network, and now we go and we do our econometric work. Okay, when we'll end up estimating some linear, you know, some simultaneous linear simultaneous equation system. Okay, to look at um, where the dependent variable will be some kind of educational outcome. All right, um, and um, uh, but on the other hand, we should recognize that networks are things, in fact, that you know, our social relationships are not just described by an edge in a graph, right? Our social relationships come and go. We use some relationships for some things, other relationships for other things. Some relationships are very intense through time, right? Uh, uh, other relationships are very, very, you know, you meet each other only occasionally or something like that. Um, and uh, so, so it's really just kind of a much more, you know, social life is just much more complicated. Right? And, and a matrix is just a way of kind of reducing this down to something that we can handle analytically. Um, but uh, we should think, we should know that, uh, um, uh, that it's very limited. So let me give you one example of this. There is a paper by um, uh, Georgi Kosinets and Duncan Watts. It's in Science. Um, I don't know, maybe a decade ago. They had data from Columbia University on who wrote to who by who sent who emails. Okay. A little troubling, you know, they had this data, um, but they only had uh, it was all hashed, I believe, and uh, they didn't know who actually sent to who. They just knew that there was an email from ID number from you know some randomly generated ID number to some other randomly generated ID number. And what they did was so they had they had data for an entire academic year, and so what they did was they constructed social networks by looking at the data. Um, uh, by chunking the data in particular ways and then taking averages. So they say, well, let's, let's record who talked to whom in a week and then, um, um, and then um, look at, 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 at the social network that emerges when you see, who, you know, on average, who talked to who in a given week, okay? And they had some rule that said, like, in over X percent of the weeks, A talked to B, then there's a link from A to B, okay? Now let's look at who talked to who over a month. And then look, let's look at who talked to who over a semester, which is now a little hard to do, but this is what they did. And of course, what they discover is that as you change the window size, the network changes, right? Which indicates, in fact, that there's a much more complicated phenomenon going on here, and the network is just kind of a, a trace of that, okay? Um, so, um, and this means that there are many more modeling opportunities than, than have actually been exploited so far. Now, um, having described, um, uh, having now established some terminology to talk about networks, um, what is it that if we actually want to measure social networks, if we want to, to see who talks to who, so let's think about a canonical example, or a couple of them. One is to think about a classroom and peer effects in a classroom or in a school, okay? Um, uh, another example might be to think about, um, for example, the diffusion of a new technology uh, maybe a new seed variety or something like this. So we might imagine having village level data um, uh, on who talks to who in different villages. There is in fact such a data set that has been built by Esther Duflo, Abhijit Banerjee, Matt Jackson and others, right? Um, and this pe a lot of people are now using this data. Um, uh, example of the first kind, how many of you know of the Ad Health data set? National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Youth, right? 
This is like the canonical data set, right, for social network research and education. Um, and the uh, ad health data, in the ad health data set, students were allowed to, were asked, name up to five friends, okay? Um, and, um, uh, and so um, uh, you can, from this, you can then put together networks of, you know, who named who, right? Now we have to think about what the significance of naming is um, because it turns out that this, the networks that you look at from the ad health data set are, uh, these graphs are not undirected. I'm sorry, they're not direct, they're, they're not undirected. That's what I want to say, yes, that A, a says B is a friend, B does not say that A is a friend. What, what does that mean? It might, it might mean a lot of different things, right? Including what happened last night. So um, who knows? You know, measurement problems are, are big, right, in this literature. So anyways, um, yes? We're going to talk about that a bit later, okay? So how do we use social networks? That's the question you're asking. And the answer is we'll see, okay? But I'm not going to answer that right now because it's just I'm going to answer it in about um, probably in the second half of the talk. Well, social, social, well, well, sociologists actually, I mean, there are a number of tools that are used to talk about, for example, who are powerful people or influential people in a social network, right? And we will talk about that in just a few slides, all right? So there are, there are, so what I'm now doing is providing, is describing a tool set, and later on, I will talk about some of the things that we can do with this tool set, okay? I'm going to talk about it the way that, the ways in which economists use social networks, and not the ways that sociologists do, largely because I only have so much time, okay? Um, but sociologists actually use um, exactly what we're talking about here in order to construct things like power indices of different kinds. So we will talk, for example, about centrality in a network, okay? Hmm? Well, they, I mean, they, one thing one can do is ask who is powerful in a network. One can also ask what is the distribution of power in a network, right? Um, there are a number of questions like this. Um, I think almost anything you can think of, someone has done, all right? Um, doesn't mean they've done it well, um, doesn't, um, but um, uh, now how do you move from networks to larger institutions? How do you move from networks to class? Right? Um, um, so um, I am puzzled about that, having read a fair amount of the sociology literature. It seems to me that um, the, um, the literature divides into two parts, okay? So if we just think about sociologists per se, there are people who I would call micro-network people. Stanley Wasserman would be a good example of this. And they like to go into a high school and they like to measure the networks in the high school, right? And then you have people like Ron Bird and Mark Granovetter, right, who I think of as macro-network guys. And Ron Burt, do you know Ron Burt, or have you read anything of his? Sorry. Right. So, so he writes a lot about, about network structures and organizations and how, how the network structure of an organization determines organizational outcomes, okay? Um, and and uh, so he's done a lot of work, for example, comparing French and American corporate um, uh, networks, networks of within, who talks to who within a corporation, right? And, and he's developed a bunch of concepts for um, uh, talking about what makes a network structure um, um, Productive, okay. So I'm going to stop here, but I want to say that there is a you know there are literature and 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 there are a number of economists, uh, for example, Bob Gibbons at at, at MIT, um, who have been um, you know interested in and contributed to this literature, okay. So so um, there are both economists and sociologists who talk on this. If you want to get back to very traditional things like class and power, um, um, you know I had I had lunch just last week with a, uh, um, an economist at NYU who thinks that the problem with the way in which economists talk about inequality is that we don't talk about class anymore, 
Okay, um, and um, uh, and I think that there is. So I think that there's actually a fair amount of truth to what he says, um, uh, although one has to be careful in what one means by class. Um, and 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 again, uh, I think that network structures can be used to talk about that, um, because we have to think. You know, we have to think about what class would mean. Okay, and you have to have some way of defining what is a class, right? And in the way that has to do with social relations, right? So we're going to model them in some networky kind of way, not necessarily this way, but I don't know what that is, and I don't think anybody does. Great research topic, but that is in the kind that you do after, the, after you get tenure. <laughs> okay. Um, harking back to our discussion of yesterday with, uh, with Scott. Um, so let me, let me I, 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 want to really, I want to really drive and get through this stuff so that we can get to something interesting um, um, and actually talk about substantive ap applications. So I'm going to be mean from now on. Um, um, in the first thing we might want to do with a social network is describe it in some ways. How might we describe a social network? Um, it's one thing to look at pretty pictures, but it's also nice to have some, some, some uh, ways of describing it, um, uh, you know, other ways of describing it, particularly numerical ways of describing it. And here is a list that you now um, uh, have had a chance to, um, uh, to internalize the graph diameter, the maximal length, the maximal distance between any two people in the network. Um, uh, the average distance between any two people in the network. These are obvious things to, to think about if we want to think about diffusion of information, for example, in a network. Uh, the degree distribution. Um, again, if we want to think about who is important in a social structure and who is not, um, maybe degree would be important. Maybe people who have a lot of connections are important. Maybe not. Okay, um, That's a complicated topic, and we're going to come back to it. Um, uh, the... Uh, uh, clustering coefficient is interesting. Um, why is this an interesting thing to measure? The average over all vertices of the number of length two paths containing a given uh, uh, person uh, that are part of a... Tr um, actually, I, we should, I should drop containing i. It's just the average of the number of length two paths uh, that are part of a triangle. So if I have a length two path, it connects three people. Right, A to B to C, right? So if I have a path, uh, an edge from A and an edge to B, is there an edge to, from A to C as well? Are they triangles? Um, why is this an interesting thing to, uh, to ask? Well, well, sociologists have claimed for a long time, and, and, and it's a property, it's a, once you actually get network data and measure it, it turns out to be true, um, that if there is an edge from A to B and an edge from A to C, it is more likely that there will be an edge from I said that wrong. If there is an edge from A to B and an edge from B to C, if A is friends with B and B is friends with C, then it is more likely than average um, uh, that uh, A will be a friend of C as well. Right? In other words, that, 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 that friendship is at least to some degree a transitive relationship. Okay? So measuring the degree of transitivity, all right, um, this is what the clustering coefficient does. Okay? Um, by the way, if you're interested in revealed preference things, right, um, and you want to think about, um, uh, um, you know, is, uh, uh, if you have a bunch of discrete bundles and you have some laboratory data, you can actually do the same kind of thing. A is revealed preferred to B. B is revealed preferred to C. Is A revealed preferred to C or not, right? So you could actually talk about the clustering coefficient as a measure of the degree of transitivity of any relationship because any relationship can be represented by a directed graph, okay? Um, uh, and there are economic applications of this that have nothing to do with social structure, okay? Um, all right, let me move on. Um, uh, so here, are, uh, here is a graph just so that we can see um, um, what some of these things are. There are three components in this graph. The minimum degree is one because A, for example, has, is of degree one, B is of degree one, so on and so forth. The maximal degree in this graph is four. H is of degree four, has degree four. There are four edges emanating from H. Um, the diameter, the, there, the large, there's uh, two small components and a large component, okay? So you can compute the component size distribution if you want. Um, the, uh, uh, in the large component, the diameter of the component is three. Um, there is uh, uh, any 
node in the large component can be connected to any other component by at most three edges. Okay, so k to f, k to j, j to g, g to f. Okay, um, uh, I've computed for you the degree distribution and also the clustering coefficient of the large component. Um, so, um, uh, and I did the clustering coefficient this morning, so it might not be right. Um, I'm bad at numbers, so I'm a theorist. Um, okay, um, so uh, where, um, moving on beyond descriptive properties of a single graph, right? Um, typically, what we are going to, often what we will have is a data on a large number of networks, um, uh, and we want to describe, um, uh, uh, we, 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 we want to make some inference about network properties. So I might want to say something in general about, about, about the nature of, of um, networks um, in, uh, uh, in Indian villages, right? So, which is something that um, the aforementioned authors did, right? Well, how am I going to do that? In order to actually engage in inference, I'm going to need some kind of probabilistic model, OK? Um, so what do these probabilistic models look like? Um, why do I want them first? I guess that's the question. Why do I want them? Um, well, uh, uh, I, I've listed here two questions that are natural questions to ask. Having observed data from a bunch of networks in my sample of Indian villages, what can I infer about the properties of other networks? Okay, an obvious thing to ask. Um, um, or having observed data from some part of a network, okay, um, what, can I, what can I infer <coughs> about um, other properties of the network. So um, how many of you have heard the phrase six degrees of separation? Right, okay, a number of you have, right? You know that there is a play by this name, right? And the, I, I think the idea is actually due to a Czech playwright um, from the 20s, and I actually, I have the reference somewhere in my speaking notes, but I'm not going to take the time to dig it up um, now, um, even though my speaking notes have disappeared. Um, okay, and I just said I wasn't going to look it up, so why am I looking it up? I should stop. Okay. Um, the, uh, um, uh, so there was a famous experiment. Uh, the quality of the experiment can be... Um, is, is maybe best suggested by, by, by knowing that the uh, original paper was published in a journal called Psychology Today. How many of you know what Psychology Today is? Is it still published? Yeah. Yeah, you buy it on newsstands, right? It's a pop, social, it's a pop social science journal, right? So you can guess it wasn't refereed. And someone actually came back and wrote a, a, did, did some research into how this experiment was conducted. It was just horrifying. Right? This is, this is, if there is something that is trash social science, it is this experiment that was done. Um, uh, you can go and look it up for yourselves. But the, the experiment was basically the following. Um, we give a, uh, um, a bunch of, of, of envelopes to some people, and we give them a target individual in some other part of the country, right? And we say, you know, get this, get this, get this envelope to that person who lives in Rhode Island, right? And, um, uh, and, and so, you know, what, is, what, what would you do if you're a subject? You say, well, gee, you know, I've got a cousin who lives in Rhode Island, and maybe he can help. And so you send this envelope off to your cousin. And then your cousin gets it and says, well, this guy lives in Pawtucket, OK? Um, I know someone who lives in Pawtucket. And then, it, you know, and so how long does it take, right? How, how long, what is the path, right? Uh, uh, and, and so everybody, you know, had to, you know, kind of record, you know, their information, you know, who they were or where they were from, and then they, you know, on, on the sheet, and they put it on the envelope, and they send it on to the next person, and then how long, how long does it, does it take? Um, so um, the uh, average path length, I think, uh, was six. The modal path length, or the average, I don't remember. Um, and and uh, actually, I think it was five in what was reported. Okay, and so um, we were led to believe, right, that the social distance between any two people in the United States, measured by the geodesic of the friendship social network, um, is in, or or measured by average path. I don't measured by whatever that thing is measuring. Who knows what it's measuring, right? But that, but it, but well, actually, what it says is that is that is that is that. Uh, um, the average geodesic would have to be less than five. It would have to be five or less. G 
geodesic length would be five or less, okay? Um, so it turns out that there's a, a huge number of problems with this experiment, including looking at what was actually reported as opposed to what was actually observed. Um, so, and I'm not gonna go into that, but this is a very powerful idea, right, that has, that has um, played a role um, in how people think about social structure in the United States, right? Um, and uh, um, so, um, there is, is an example about how you, in, I, I mentioned this experiment because it is an example about how you infer structure of an entire large graph. What does the friendship network of the United States look like from sampling some part of the network by doing this kind of experiment, okay? All right, and, and so um, again, we have an inference problem. There's a much larger network. I'm only observing a few paths through the network. What can I say about the network as a whole? Right? Well, in order to answer that question, I'm going to need some kind of probabilistic model that's going to allow me to say, well, you know, that, that, that I have some con with some confidence some feature that I have measured in this, you know, that I can make some inference from the sample that I have, um, namely the looking at the sample average network, you know, sample average path length to geodesic lengths in the population as a whole, right? I'm going to need some kind of probabilistic model to do that. Um, and so we have... Um, um, Two kinds of, of, of models for networks, um, network formation, I guess you could call it, um, that we can use to, um, <clears throat> to apply to this kind of problem. There are um, um, basically descriptive random models of networks. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at things called random graphs. Right? And one way of thinking about what a random graph might be is simply to think about, well, we've got these incidence matrices, right? So just imagine a random matrix. We can all imagine a random matrix, right? And that's actually rep that's a representation of a random graph. So um, there's a large literature on random graphs. For those of you who really like math, um, there's a wonderful book on random graph theory by Rick Durrett, a mathematician at Duke University, um, that I highly recommend. Uh, the proofs are readable. Um, uh, Rick is a very gifted uh, writer and a very gifted teacher, actually. Uh, so uh, um, that's a good place to go. So there are um, um, stochastic block models are popular in the sociology community, less so in the economics community among people who do this. Um, there's something called exponential random graphs. Um, uh, Matt Jackson is a big fan of exponential random graphs at the moment. He has a paper uh, with a young colleague, a junior colleague at Stanford that you must know about that um, uh, uh, on exponential random graphs and sufficient statistics for them. Um, a separate uh, and second way of thinking about, about, about graphs more generally is to have structural models of graph formation. Okay, and we saw an example of such a model yesterday. So Scott talked about, um, about, um, about matching, right? And he talked about matching in the context of, of thinking about how um, uh, this engineering concept of how do, you, how do you solve the problem of assigning children to schools, right? Now, um, how many of you have read or know of let me start with the know of question. How many of you know of the original Gail Shapley paper called College, um, um, what is it, College Admission, College, this, College Admissions and Marriage are in the title. The stability of, do you remember the title exactly? No, it's, it's, it's uh, something like college, college Admissions and the Stability of Marriage, something like this, right? Um, how many of you know this article? One, two, right, okay, like, Five people. This is sad. Okay, so so this paper is what won uh, Lloyd Chapley, right? His piece of the Nobel Prize, and it was published in a journal called the American Mathematical Monthly. How many of you know the American Mathematical Monthly? You do, right? So this is a journal, basically, for for um, um, uh, high school teachers and 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 people who teach mathematics, and it's it's kind of like. Um, good recreational mathematics and, and written for people who find short expository papers on functional analysis amusing, okay? It's kind of the audience. It's, I don't know who the audience is, but it's basically kind of meant to be a fu fun journal with nice facts that you can use in your teaching and stuff like this and expository pieces on literally small things on little problems. And so they wrote this paper um, uh, um, where they devised the... Um, uh, the deferred acceptance, uh, they pose the problem of stability, 
right? Um, and the way they posed the problem was the following. Uh, and let's remember this paper was written in the early 60s. There are men and there are women and they marry each other. Okay, um, and so they say that uh, what we might expect to see as an outcome of social process now, not engineering, okay, but as an outcome of social process is a stable, as a stable bipartite graph. What do I mean by a bipartite graph? A bipartite graph is a graph where we divide the vertices into two sets. That set V, we divide into, we partition into V1 and V2, and all edges have one, a member of V1 on one side and a member of V2 on the other side. So we can describe marriages this way as a bipartite graph where men marry women, okay, women marry men, all right? And uh, as I said, that was the early 60s, and uh, it seemed to work, okay? So now, what should, as a result of social process of some kind that we're not gonna talk about, what should that graph, what property should that graph look like? One property is stability, right? Um, that, uh, uh, that any woman that I might want to marry is in fact married to somebody that she prefers to me, okay? And any man that some woman might want to marry is in fact married to someone that he prefers to her. So that, in other words, no divorces are possible, okay? Um, uh, or actually, no divorces, are per no divorces and remarriage are improving for the couple involved, okay? So that's stability, okay? That's a model, right? You can think about that as an attribute of something that you want. That's what Scott talked about yesterday, right? But you can also think about it as an equilibrium description of social process, okay? Um, uh, and... Um, it has connections both to non-cooperative game theory and to cooperative game theory, which I'm not actually going to talk about today. Um, uh, so, that's, so that's an example of a structural model of network formation. And in fact, this, is, um, in fact, uh, this idea is in fact generalized to arbitrary network formation in a paper by um, um, Matt Jackson and Asher Walensky, um, uh, which is published in JET. Uh, and, um, uh, introduces a concept which is called uh, pairwise stability. And, um, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so, if we're, so how are we going to do stochastic social network analysis? What we're going to do is we're going to treat networks as realizations of, uh, of a random variable. And we're going to propose a model for the distribution of these random variables. We're going to fit the model to some observed data. And then we're going to interpret the parameters to gain insight into the properties of the network and to infer properties of other networks that we think might have been generated by the same kind of data generating process, right? So this is really no different. The whole point of my saying this is to say that it's no different than any other kind of econometric exercise you've ever done, okay? Um, so here's an example of a random graph. Um, uh, and um, this is not a good model of social networks. Um, for reasons I'll talk about in a minute, but uh, here's a model. Um, we might imagine that we have a set of vertices and, we, uh, and therefore every pair is a potential edge. And what we do is we flip a coin and if it comes up heads, we assign, uh, we, we say, okay, that's an edge in our network and if it comes up tails, we don't, okay? So now I've just described a data generating process that generates a random graph, right? Okay, so what does that graph look like? Um, well, it's got a lot of random edges, okay? And this is an IID, right? Um, so, um, um, so I now have essentially, you know, I've, I, I, one can now ask questions on the order of, you know, what is the mean clustering coefficient as a function of P and N? What is the mean, ge you know, the, the average geodesic length as a function of P for given N? So on and so forth. One can ask all these questions. Um, typically, we're interested in when we do empirical work, we're interested in asymptotics, right? If we want to, we want to know how good our estimates are, what are going to be as we look at as larger and larger data. So we're going to want to perform some kind of large N analysis. Well, a natural way of doing that is to um, let, if we just let N get large and we keep P the same, what's gonna happen is that, is that the number of, of vertices that everybody has is on average gonna scale linearly with N, right? And so all we're gonna have is a, is, is a lot of vertices. That's not terribly useful um, and not terribly realistic, we might suspect, for any phenomena we might wanna measure. A more natural thing to do is to keep the degree of a given individual on average fixed, okay? So 
any given individual in a graph of size n <clears throat> has n minus 1 potential edges, OK? If the probability of a given edge is p, the expected number of edges that that individual has is p times n minus 1. So why don't we perform the experiment of letting n get large and let p get small, such that p times n minus 1 remains constant. The expected degree remains constant, OK? And that, of course, should make you think of, a, of the um, uh, Poisson approximation to binomial distributions, right? This is how we get a Poisson distribution from a binomial distribution. We let n get large and p small such that np remains constant, right? Okay. Um, so that's what we're going to do here. So what does this random graph look like? Okay. Well, there's a lot of fascinating facts about this random graph. So um, the coolest fact is what's known as the phase transition. Um, and I've kind of pictured it here. So what is the story? The graph behaves very differently in a number of ways depending upon whether the mean degree is greater than or less than 1. Okay? <clears throat> if the mean degree is less than 1, basically the graph breaks up into a number of independent islands of different sizes, okay? a number of different components of different sizes, and the, um, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the size distribution is exponential. The component size distribution is exponential, and the, um, uh, and the coefficient, you know, the parameter of the exponential distribution clearly depends upon z, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the mean size gets uh, smaller. Um, obviously, the smaller z is. That's kind of the end of the story. When z is equal, is greater than 1, we get a very different story. We have the emergence of something which people refer to as the gi giant connected component, okay? So uh, as uh, n gets very large, if z is greater than 1, we get the following picture. We have one large island, which is the largest island, okay? And that island grows in size linearly with n, okay? And all of the other islands except for the large island, if we look at the distribution, the size distribution of all components other than the largest, they are um, um, of exponential, uh, I think they're, they're exponential in, exponentially distributed, and the number of, uh, and, and I think the, the size, the mean size grow, grows something like log n, okay? So you get a, the picture that should be emerging is a bunch of little small islands and then this giant continent, okay? And the size of that continent is going to depend upon z. So when z is very near one, that continent is going to be very small. And when z is very large, that continent is going to involve most of the people, most of the vertices. And that's what we see in this picture. This is connections per node. This is measuring z. Here is one. Um, this is a, um, a simulation of some large number. I don't remember how many uh, uh, random graphs uh, on, uh, that were drawn on a, a set of, uh, of uh, 300 nodes. This is the fraction. The, uh, the, the vertical axis is measuring the fraction of nodes that are in the giant connected component. Okay? And you see that um, uh, there's this radical change um, around 1. Okay? Um, and, and, and so this is a pretty picture, um, and it's also provable. And you can find a proof in the direct book. Um, the proof is even understandable to a normal human being. Okay? Um, all right. Um, here's another model, by the way, so, so, for all, so for example, it turns out that the clustering coefficient for um, among many, the many ways in which Bernoulli random graphs do not well represent social networks is that, is that if we look at the social networks that we know and have measured, clustering coefficients in social networks tend to be higher. Okay, than, than what you get in, 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 in Bernoulli random graphs. There are other ways in which they're different as well. Um, another, another measure, another, another model is something called preferential attachment. Um, um, and uh, uh, preferential attachment has been used to talk about, for example, income distribution, city side distribution, things like this. The, um, um, it generates uh, Ziff's law for a degree distribution. Okay, so here is the. Um, for those of you who know what Zipf's law is, the rest of you, there's Google, okay? Um, and the, uh, um, the idea of preferential attachment, I think I might even have that on a slide. Wouldn't it be nice if I did? Yes. So it's a directed graph. We're going to build a directed graph, and we have a vertex set with n vertices. Um, we're going to start with the ver first vertex. We're going to construct this graph algorithmically, 
Okay, I'm going to give you an algorithm for for constructing a this, this graph. Well, actually, I gave you an algorithm for the Bernoulli random graph as well. I said we've got these edges. You draw an edge, you flip a coin. That's an algorithm for constructing a graph, right? Here's how you do this. You take edge one, you hold it up here. Okay. Now you draw another edge. Just grab another edge, um, and uh, um, and you you uh, flip a coin. Um, if it comes up heads, you just um, link it to um, uh, to node one. Actually, l let me now. Well, let me describe. I'm just going to describe this inductively. So imagine that we've already constructed some part of the graph. We now draw a new edge. What we're going to do is we're going to draw an edge at random, and what we're going to do is we're going to connect it to pre-existing nodes, right? So when we we're going to start with node one. Then we draw node two. Where I, it's either a, we're going to flip a coin, and if it comes up heads, we're going to connect it to node one. Otherwise, we're not going to connect it at all. Right? We draw a third one, and then we're going to do is connect it randomly to one of one or two. Okay. Here's what we're going to do next. Um, um, once we have a bunch of already existing part of the graph, we have our already existing part of the graph. We draw a new vertex with probability p. Probability, well, with probability one half, we're flipping a coin. If the coin comes up heads, we just connect it to one of the pre-existing nodes at random, okay? And if it comes up, um, uh, if it comes up tails, what we do is we connect it. We connect it to the last node, okay? Um, that we that we that we um, uh, attached it to. So I guess actually with this particular algorithm. Everything is going to be connected, so the second node will be connected to the first node. The third node will be connected to the either the first or the second. Um, the fourth node will we 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 draw um, uh, 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 we we flip the coin. If it comes up heads, we connect it to one of one, two, three at random. If it comes up tails, we connect it to three. Okay, um, and if we do this, okay, we get a model um, which is called the preferential attachment model. It turns out to be a good model for looking at, for example, um, graphs of citations. Okay, um, it has the property that large. Um, so, um, well, I've listed some of the properties here, uh, and um, uh, one of the things that's interesting about this model is that it generates a fat-tailed node distribution. Okay. So what we see in city size distribution is we see fat tails. What we see in wealth distributions is we see fat tails, right? This generates a fat tailed degree distribution, okay? Uh, and it's one of the reasons why it's a popular model for a number of things. Um, um, so I just offer, I don't offer this as a particular model that you should employ in your work, but I wanted to give you some examples of random, random networks. And here's, here's kind of what a preferential attachment model graph looks like. So here's just a representation of one. Okay, let me let me move on. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk. I have like I'm going to take a break in four minutes. Okay, uh, but before I do that, I want to I want to I want to talk a little bit about about why what we might do um, with social networks. And I'm going to talk about about. So I'm going to actually take ten minutes. And I'm going to talk about two papers. Okay. Um, so one is a uh, um, uh, a well-known paper on crime. Um, and uh, how many of you know this paper? Appeared in the QJE, right? Uh, okay, so, uh, but it's a good paper, okay? I know it appeared in the QJE, but it's a good paper. And, um, um, uh, and it looks at a puzzle in crime data, okay? Um, the norm, you know, let's think about, about the, uh, uh, since we're at Chicago, let's think about Gary Becker's model of crime. Right? So the model of crime is really pretty simple. Um, you basically look at the opportunity cost of committing a crime, okay, and you commit a crime um, if it's worthwhile. Okay? So you have some, you know, what you can earn if you don't commit a crime. If you commit the crime, you get the payoff to the crime if you're, if you're not caught. But if you are caught, you, know, you, you pay a penalty, you get sent to jail, and so on and so forth. Right? Um, and you know, this is the, 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 uh, the model that leads to the conclusion that you can have small police forces and draconian punishments okay? um, as a way of deterring crime. Um, and so, so in that model, Right. All the variation basically comes from the circumstances of, of individuals. So if we wanted to look at variation in crime rates across cities, we would explain this by looking at the variation in characteristics of cities and their populations. 
Okay. Now, the empirical puzzle is that the variation that we see in crime rates across cities is much, much larger than you could expect would be explained by the variations in things that might enter into the opportunity cost calculation, such as the, um, uh, you know, such as the economic conditions in the city, you know, opportunities for jobs and so forth, the amount of money that's spent on policing and the nature of the penalties involved, which varies, as you know, from state to state for different kinds of crimes. Um, and, uh, uh, and so, um, uh, we have more variance than we can possibly explain by this kind of model, okay? Um, so, uh, Glazer, Sasser, Dode, and Checkman had the idea that, um, and this, by the way, is a large quote from the paper. Um, uh, they had the idea that maybe what could explain this, okay, is uh, uh, the fact that individuals' decisions are not independent, conditional on all the explananda that we have. Right? Namely, given all of the data about individual characteristics in a city, the distribution of individual characteristics in a city, um, and all of that, um, you know, people are not making IID choices. Okay? Um, so uh, uh, they built a little toy model, so I'm going to call it a model of sorts, to illustrate this idea. So let me explain this toy model very quickly. Um, let's imagine a line, um, and there's a zero, and then there are n people on either side, okay? So it's a line of length 2n plus 1. Now remember, this is not a model of crime. This is a toy model to explain their idea, okay? Um, uh, what they do at the end is some kind of reduced form estimation to estimate a coefficient that you can interpret with the toy model that I'm talking about here, okay? So you've got a, a, a line of 2n plus 1 people. Now people are of three types. There are people who are really good people, and they're colored blue. Okay, um, and there are other people who are hardened criminals, okay, and they're colored red. And then the rest of us are easily influenced, and we're all colored black, okay? So that's the picture. So here is the idea. Um, uh, everybody, um, um, uh, I, 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 uh, I guess you have to, I don't remember, they must have kind of started this with the, they must have made in the, the individual at one end of the graph, everybody is influenced by the person on their left from your perspective, okay? Um, so I guess they kind of started with a, with a random choice of criminal or not for the last person unless, you, so, so what they do is they, um, let me back up. They've got this line of like 2n plus 1. They assign red, blue, and black IID, okay? Um, and so, um, uh, the good people, type zeros, never commit a crime. The red types, the type ones, they always do. Uh, and everybody else, okay, I see it's, I imitate the neighbor on the right, okay? Um, uh, the model has two parameters, the uh, probability of type zeros and the probability of type ones, because of course the residual probability is the probability of being a type two, an influenceable person. Um, so, uh, and you imitate the person on your right. So if we, if, we, if, we, if we look, if we start at the right and we start with this red person here, means that this person looking to the right and seeing that his neighbor to the right is a criminal, he's gonna imitate his neighbor, so he's gonna commit a crime. This guy's gonna commit a crime, okay? And then, well, this is a blue type, so that chain stops, okay? And now we're gonna get a chain of blues, which is go, gonna go until we get the next red, and so on and so forth. All right, so this is, uh, again, it's, it's, not a, it's just a toy model to illustrate um, the effects of this kind of social connection. So what do the statistics of this look like? Well, again, we have, um, you know, what is the probability? Suppose that we had, we had only type zeros and type ones, okay? So P0 plus P1 would sum to one, right? And P1 is the probability that a given individual would be a criminal, so the fraction of criminals would the, the expected number of criminals um, uh, would be uh, P1 uh, times the number of people that we have, if that's the IID world, okay? What happens now? Well, essentially, the, if you do the calculation, the expected, the, the expected type of any person is P1 divided by P0 plus P1. You know, if you count yourself as influencing yourself if you're of a given type, Right? The question is, what is the probability of the, of, the, of the nearest hardened type, zero or one type, to your right? 
And that hardened type is, is, is type 0 with probability p0 and type 1 with probability p1. All right. So the uh, expected value is, uh, as I said, p1 divided by p0 plus p1. Um, um, we can look at the, uh, at the uh, um, uh, at the sample, at the sum, um, you know, the deviations from uh, the expected value. Uh, so this is the usual calculation here. If this were IID, right, we would say, and we just wanted to look at the sum, uh, we, would, we would say that the, the, um, the average number of criminals, right, would be uh, uh, P1 divided by N. Remember that, that P0 plus P1 sum to 1. And then we know that, uh, um, that, 2N plus, uh, that that sample sum times the square root of 2n plus 1. Oh, I should, oh I'm sorry, it's not n. Um, we should remember that the number of, 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 of data points here, the number of people in the sample is 2n plus 1. So um, the expected number of criminals um, if we, in the IID world is P1 times Okay, the number of data points which we have is which is two n plus one. All right, the the um, uh, the fraction of the population, right, um, which is in the IID world, which is going to be a a uh, of a criminal type, um, is going to be um, just this number that I've called p. Um, and in the IID world, of course, uh, the square root of the sample of the sample average. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the sample average times the square root of the sample size is going to be normally distributed. It's going to converge to a normal distribution as n gets large. The deviations from the, from the sample mean are going to converge to a normal distribution with a mean zero, right? And a variance, and what is that variance going to be? In the IID world, it's the usual p times 1 minus p. What happens in the world with correlation? In the world with correlation, it is going to be bigger, okay? Uh, and this is a calculation that you can do just by looking at the covariance matrix, okay? And they do this in the paper. Um, so it is going to be 2 minus uh, P0 plus P1 divided by P0 plus P1. So basically what you should know, take away from this, is that the smaller the fraction of the population that is committed and the more imitation that is going on, the longer these chains are going to be, the more correlation there is going to be, right? And therefore, the larger the variance, okay? And so as we, as we in, decrease the number of hardened types and we move away from the IID model more and more by allowing for more imitation, okay, um, uh, we increase the variance of the, of the, uh, of, of the, uh, of the population um, 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 of the object we want to measure here. You have a question. Yeah, um, so this model tries to explain the effect Well, it's, it, 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 so remember, this is not really a model of crime per se, right? But what it's trying to do is illustrate how a contagion through imitation, okay, can affect the variance of this aggregate outcome. And how about, uh, how can you explain why that agent that red dot, that guy, is that guy, how did he or she emerge uh, in the first place? It does not explain that. Right. So, so um, and that's not to say that you wouldn't want to model it, but that's not, the, the point of this toy model, mm -hmm. right, is only to explain how imitation, right, um, can, can um, answer this question, right, of, um, you know, imitation through some, of, of some kind can answer this question of why we see such a large variance, a larger variance than would be predicted, right, by the standard Beckerian model, okay? Now, um, um, uh, if you want to actually explain, so what you're asking is, well, what explains P0 and P1? Right? Where does that come from? Right? So I've just taken them as parameters for the sake of this calculation. Um, but if I wanted to build a, you know, if I wanted to build a serious model, I would then have to extend this to actually talk about where P1, P0, and P1 come from. Right? So, so this is that's why I said this is a model of sorts. It's not a real model, okay? But it is explaining a piece of such a model. The import, what what the effect of contagion would be, okay? So, Well, well, the network effect is explaining how you get this magnification of variance, 
okay? Um, and, um, and that's what the network does. The network, the network here, you know, I mean, it may well be that the network, and, and there is, uh, I used to talk about another paper which actually used some, some, some studies from some criminologists actually to talk about how people who live in networks with a lot of crime um, are more likely to engage in, these are for juveniles, and, 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 but it, it's, um, that is a long and complicated story, um, but one can use networks, so, and people have used networks to talk about that as well. Right? So there are, you know, social influence works to determine life paths that people take, and we know this, right? So, so, um, uh, but, so that is a different aspect of the way that networks might work here, but it is not the point of this paper, okay? And not the point that I want to make here. So let me, let me move on. Um, and I want to very, I'm going to, you know what? We will take a break here. Let me now talk uh, very briefly again about another research project by... Um, um, Chris Udry and Tim Conley. Um, this is a paper about the adoption of a new technology. It's actually not about a new technology, it's about the adoption of a new product. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Conley? How many of you are development economists? Okay, are you guys familiar with the, th is it only three, really? Okay, uh, uh, so are you familiar with the uh, Conley Udry stuff on, on uh, Ghanaian pineapple farms? Right, okay, that's this, okay. So, um, uh, how do farmers learn about a new technology? I might actually try, I have separate talking notes here, and having written them down, I never ever look at them, and this is probably um, not smart. Um, okay. Um, so, the story here is that, is that, is that at the time, uh, uh, these, I, the, the paper was published in 2010, but I think it actually took a long time to get into print. I think it was, it was written at least five years earlier. Um, so, you know, very early in this century or at the end of the last century, um, um, a new crop was introduced in uh, the eastern region of Ghana. So Ghana at that point, or eastern region of Ghana, had an established system of uh, maize and cassava intercropping. Right, and uh, so if you had the opportunity to to walk around in in in, in fields um, in uh, you know agrarian societies, it's very interesting to see you know the the different kinds of, of farming techniques that are used. Um, uh, although I'm a theorist, I have actually done this. I have walked around in villages in Africa and found it fascinating. Um, and anyone who's going to be a theorist, you have to do this. You know, you have to get out there. Um, so. Um, um, uh, and they were, you know, they were, they were, uh, and they were, so, so originally, you know, the, uh, the baseline was we had this maize and cassava farming and stuff was basically produced for, for, you know, uh, urban consumers, you know, in cities relatively nearby. And um, uh, this, at, at the turn of the century, this began to be replaced by intensive production of pineapples for export to the European market. Okay, which has all kinds of interesting implications that we're not going to pursue. Um, so an important component of this transportation was that the whole farming system had to be changed, and in particular, um, um, uh, agriculture. The, the there was a change in the agricultural chemicals. Um, uh, so so fertilizer had to be used in order has to be used in order to grow um, uh, pineapple. Fertilizer was not necessarily in the previous it was not necessary in the previously established farming system. So um, uh, Conley and Udry studied the question: um, uh, How did farmers learn about how to use fertilizer in this new farming system? All right, so it's a kind of a narrow question within the context of this larger transformation of farming systems that um, obviously has many more implications than um, what you do with fertilizer. Um, so there's a natural model uh, that most of us would write down as a starting point. Um, uh, um, there are three places, several places you might imagine learning about this stuff. Farmers might learn from their own experimentation um, uh, uh, what happens from year to year is I vary the amount of fertilizer that I use, or I might even, if, I, if my plot is big enough, I might even divide it in half and do a different treatment. Um, there are, in, uh, there is in Ghana, as there, as there is in many developing countries, there are agricultural extension services, 
right? Um, and uh, there are media that will actually talk about, you know, how do you do this? Um, and then, of course, one might also learn, um, you, know, from, uh, you know, from what your friends and neighbors are, are, are doing. So there is a, a baseline model for this and a number of papers. I've written some names up here. Um, uh, Tim Besley and Ann Case, Mark uh, Rosenzweig and Andy Foster, uh, Kai von Munchi have all studied this kind of question. Um, and they think about this the following way. This is the baseline model. A village is itself a learning unit. Some farmers experiment trying out the new technology. I'm now speaking more generally, not just about Ghana. Um, some farmers experiment with the new technology. Others do not. Um, that is to say, some farmers try out the new technology, others do not. Each farmer in the village observes the farming activities of everybody else in the village. Um, they then update their beliefs in an appropriate way um, and then make <clears throat> decisions about cultivation for the next season, right? So this is kind of the canonical, uh, a canonical kind of social learning model, all right? Um, so um, what did Conley and Udry do? I think that um, I don't know whether Chris was involved in this collection. I think he was. Um, collected a, a uh, uh, um, data uh, about, on 450 individuals in four clusters of villages uh, in Ghana over a period of not quite two years, um, uh, just before the turn of the century. Um, and they got uh, um, uh, data on both inputs and outputs at frequent times. And they got a variety of data as well on how farmers interacted with each other. So they got what we would call social network data. Um, the social network data that they got um, was interesting. Um, they, asked, they asked farmers what they knew about how to use fertilizer. Um, they also asked the farmers what they knew about what other people were doing. And they also asked farmers if they knew about what other people were getting right, from, from, from their use, right? Um, and, um, and they asked more generally, well, do you talk about farming? You know, who do you talk about farming with, right? And how much do you talk about farming with? So they had a lot of detailed data about social interaction here, okay? Um, uh, and uh, each, so what did they find? So, so, so basically what they found was the following. Um, uh, they, they took a farmer and then they took 10 other random people in the village and, they say, and then they said, well, let's look at our data and see how that farmer, our chosen farmer, interacted with these 10 people chosen at random. And what they discovered um, was that in only a very small fraction of you know, the matches, namely uh, typically less than one person on average, did the farmer know, the target farmer know anything about what the other farmer was doing. Okay, so we've got our target farmer, we've got 10 other people, so we look at the data. Does this farmer know about what any of these 10 people were doing, right? The average number was less than one. It was 11% of the, well, I guess more than one, a little bit more than one, 1.1, 1 .1, right? In 11% of the matches, um, had one of the two individuals ever received advice about farming from the other? Um, in less than a third of the 10 individuals, um, did our target individual even think that the social relationship was such that we could ask about something as in intimate as farming practice, okay? Um, and, um, and what did they know about what other people were doing? Had some information on, on, on inputs and harvest? Only in 7%, okay? So basically, this isn't what you would expect to see, right? In a model where the village is a learning unit as a whole and everybody knows about say, the average outcome of the village and the average experience of the village. This is really, this is really quite different. So um, the conclusion that they, that they you know, draw from this is what I've said in red is that information flows through a sparse social network. So here is one village, um, um, uh, a small village, actually, um, and um, that comes from another part of their data set, I think. And, um, uh, and here is a badly designed, badly drawn plot of the social network. Um, and basically you can see that, that as opposed to this being a complete graph, right? Every individual is connected um, to relatively few number of people. We've got some, this is, there are, by the way, there is software that allows you to draw these graphs in such a way that you can actually see something. Right? 
Um, uh, Chris and Tim didn't use that software here, evidently. What they were doing was something else. They wanted to correlate this with physical distance. Okay, so um, they actually started with more or less a, ma a map of where people actually lived. So this is a kind of spatial econometrics here, right? Uh, and then they drew the edges um, for, you know, for a real, a real talking relationship, and this is what it looked like. Um, uh, but you, so you, 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 you can't quite see, but if you look a little bit more carefully, you'll see that there are a few people of high degree um, and uh, everybody else is, 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 is talking only to um, not very many people at all. Um, so what they did in their paper, um, I've just given you a, 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 a quick outline of, um, um, of uh, what they did. It's a very complicated work, okay? What I want you to understand by looking at the last graph is that thinking about how to deploy a standard learning model like Bayesian updating in a network framework is really very difficult, right? Um, so, uh, you know, you can make all kinds of simplifying assumptions in order to get this to fly, um, but it doesn't, it, 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 uh, um, uh, it is certainly a very complicated learning process and has led many people to think um, that it is both um, conceptually easier from a modeling point of view and also perhaps more realistic um, uh, uh, from an agent point of view to think about alternative learning models um, that are uh, simpler. And you are going to get all of my notes, and uh, not, you know, including the parts of my notes that I'm not going to get to talk about. And, um, and there is a discussion of learning models in these notes, including de Groot learning, which is different than Bayesian learning, um, and um, references therein. And so I would encourage you to take a look at those on, on your own. Um, okay. Um, and, uh, okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm just going to move on. They found a bunch of interesting stuff. Read the paper. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me talk a little bit about, about, about what social networks might look like. Um, so what I've done, just done is to give you two examples of why you might care about social networks and how we can ask questions about social networks. And, and I want to highlight in the, um, uh, in, the, in the two examples, we use the networks in two different ways, right? So in the, in the Conley Udry paper, we asked at a very micro level, what is going on with this individual? What is going on with that individual? So we were essentially looking at micro level, be looking to estimate micro level behavioral rules, okay? Um, in the, in the you know, understanding that there's an underlying network process going on, right? If I wanted to come back to your question about why is the dot blue and another dot red, right? That's what I would do, right? I would, and I wanted to measure a look at for network effects in that. I would build a model um, uh, that would uh, essentially look at the choice of whether or not to engage in a criminal activity as a function of stuff that actually reflected the network structure in some way by looking at who I'm influenced by and so on and so forth and, and, and their attributes and my own attributes and their activities and, and so on. Um, so that's a micro level thing, okay? Um, by, in way of contrast, the, by way of contrast, the Glazer, Sacerdote, and Schenkman paper um, does a different exercise. It says that we're interested in a macro level puzzle. Why do, how do we explain variation over cities, okay? And the answer they propose is that we can understand uh, um, one ex possible explanation Right? Remember, they didn't test, and, and, and there's no way you could conclude from what they did to say that this is the explanation. But one explanation is to say that individuals in cities do not make choices that are IID contingent upon, uh, conditional on um, their attributes and the attributes of the environment in which they live, that in fact choices are correlated through some kind of social influence. Okay? Um, and they make a compelling case, well, they attempt to make a compelling case, um, and how much you believe it depends upon your own tastes and your own prior beliefs, and so on and so forth, as it is with any paper. Um, but they attempt to make a case for, for um, 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 why this is um, a, a, a plausible explanation. And, and I, my own personal view is that they get some way there. I mean, it's, it's um, but, the, um, but the key idea here is that what we're looking for, um, 
there are two things that one might look at in studying networks, right, or looking at the consequences of networks. One is to look at what goes on at the individual level, and another is to look at what goes on in the emergent properties of systems that are governed by networks, right? And by emergent properties, I mean properties that exist that we measure at a, a temporal or spatial or, or size scale, which is different from the driving equations of the system. Now, the driving equations of the system really are at the, are at the individual level. What do you do? What do you do um, as a function of the environment that you're in, right? But the aggregate thing that we want to explain right, it is, it exists at a different level. It is what is the variance across all these different cities, right? And, um, uh, and that was the, so studying this emergent property, this extreme variance, right, was the, um, uh, was the topic of the glazer sacerdote and Scheckman paper, um, as opposed to in the Conley Udry paper, the question is, what do individuals do, right? Um, and so networks are useful in both these, in these, both very, di in these very different ways. Um, um, the the glazer sacerdote and Scheckman paper also serves to point out that, that um, uh, when we look for, for um, connections across individuals um, beyond that which we would typically assume in a, in a, more, in a more traditional economic model, um, we see that the, the systemic effects are different, okay? Um, this might lead you to think that welfare effects are going to be different, right? Um, and therefore, we might want to worry um, uh, about that if we're doing policy analysis. All right, moving on, let's go back to talking a little bit about properties of social networks. Um, I think what I want to point out here, and I need to look at my notes to do this, um, to remember exactly what the key things are, um, is that um, uh, this is a, um, a collection of, uh, uh, this table comes from a paper that uh, a guy named Mark Newman wrote. He's at the University of Michigan, um, uh, and he's connected with their complex systems group there. Um, and these are, are data that come from a variety of different studies of uh, different social networks um, uh, that obviously have very different generating processes uh, behind them. Uh, and um, uh, I guess there are some things that are, 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 are worth pointing out um, is that these social networks are, are, are pretty large, okay? Um, and uh, in many of them, the mean degree is very small. Uh, so, you know, for example, here we have a network with uh, 47 million people in it, and the average degree is um, um, in this data, and I think this is actually British data for this study, is 3.16. I think this comes from Northern Telecom. Um, that's like really small, and we've got 47 million people. Um, uh, in this, in you know, in this data set, uh, here we have a uh, biology co-authorship. 11 million. Um, how many nodes? I'm sorry, not 11. We have we have 1.5 million nodes, right? The mean degree is 15, and yet you know, look at the small size of the of the uh, of the uh, of the geodesic of the mean geodesic length. It's only it's like five, right? Um, uh, and that's you know that's kind of surprising. So one thing about social networks that seems to make them different from, say, randomly, entirely random, like the Bernoulli random network, is that they are relatively easy to traverse, okay? The other thing that's true about them is that, is that um, clustering coefficients are higher than you would expect at random. So these are our two features. Now, you're going to have access to these slides, and you can look at this um, uh, data for yourself uh, and, 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 and look at some, you know, see that... Um, and think for yourself about how these would differ from just coin flipping to determine a network. Um, and they're pretty different. So here is uh, um, a network that comes from a study uh, by Peter Behrman. And I don't remember, is it Jim Moody? Might have been his co-author, I'm not sure. Um, uh, and this has to do with um, um, uh, a uh, network of social relationships in a high school, okay? Um, who is dating who, okay? Uh, and um, uh, so, uh, as you can see, uh, blue vertices are male, pink vertices are female, and there is an edge between them if they reported a relationship within, the, um, uh, within a given six-month window. Okay, I think it's a six-month window. And I do not um, recall uh, exactly what the definition of relationship, what the question was, right? 
Um, uh, and there is a reference to this paper in the back of my notes, and so you can take a look for yourself. And again, um, what you see is that, is that um, and this is something I should have said earlier, that uh, if you think about the Bernoulli random graph, right, we had this feature of there being a giant connected component, okay, and, um, uh, and, uh, and then a bunch of little islands, okay. It turns out that that is a feature of many, many random graphs, not just the Bernoulli random graph. It's easy to prove in the Bernoulli random graph, harder in other things, but, but, but it is, um, in, 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 in fact, kind of a typical property, and we see it here. We see a lot of small groups, all right, um, so uh, just quickly how to read this. Here are 63 stable pairs throughout the sampling period. Um, this person was connected, had a relationship with these two men, this man with these two women, um, and this guy and this guy just with these. Those are the only relationships reported in the window. So that's how to read the graph. You'll notice again that there is a giant connected component. Okay, and there are also here um, a few nodes of very high degree. If I had a pointer, I would point them out, okay? Um, so this is, how many remember high school? Okay, does this ringing any bells? Okay, um, so um, another thing that, that they make a big deal of, um, and I would encourage you to go to read the paper to talk, to read why they make a big deal of this, is that this graph is very close to something called the spanning tree, which is to say that it's really got a, if you, if you cut the circle, okay, uh, in, the, in, the, in the big component, you basically have a tree, right? Um, uh, uh, I'm sure you all had a discussion of game trees in, uh, in, your, you know, in your first year micro class. So think, think game trees, right? So you know what a tree is, okay? So it's pretty tree-like. Um, uh, let's skip that. Um, here is a, 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 another social network that comes from another school, and this is a paper by Jim Moody. And um, I don't remember who, he's got co-authors there. Um, and this comes from seven, I think these are seventh and eighth graders or sixth and seventh graders in a middle school somewhere in Ohio, okay? Um, and um, the way to look at this graph is you have to know that um, uh, the graph was drawn, um, so that older, the older classmates are on top and the younger classmates are on the bottom, okay? And then the graph is drawn in such a way basically is to minimize, there are algorithms for drawing these graphs um, where you try to draw the graph so basically to minimize the length of the edges you need um, um, in order to represent the graph. Now, the nodes are colored here and they're colored by ethnicity, okay? And the pale nodes are are, are whites, the green nodes are blacks, the pink nodes are Asian or other. I don't, I think it's other, okay? Because there must have been some Hispanics in the school as well. Um, and, um, uh, and the point that they wanted to make here um, was that in the social network there is clustering. There is clustering both by age, okay? So you see that there are relatively, um, there's a lot of horizontal edges uh, and not so many vertical edges relative to the number of horizontal edges, okay? Um, and, um, and then on the other hand, individuals are also clustered by, um, at least these two main groups, whites and blacks, are clustered by, um, uh, uh, clustered by their type, by their, by, their, by their ethnicity or race. Okay, clustered by, I think it's race, clustered by their race, okay? Um, and this is a, uh, um, an example Right, of a property which is common to social networks, which is called homophily, right? uh, that like individuals tend to link to like individuals. Okay? And we'll have um, something more to say about that um, in just a little bit. Okay? Um, okay. Uh, we've already talked about transitivity, so um, uh, here is a slide that says something about transitivity. Um, you've read the slide, we can move on. Okay, I've talked about this several times. Yes? Are there common measures that we use for homophily or is it segregation? Um, so how does one, how does one measure? Um, there are two, there are, are two ways of looking at this. One is that you can identify external groups and then say, what is the likelihood that, they are, that, that there are links like this? And, what, and there's an obvious way of measuring homophily, which is to say, um, um, Let's look at the, um, 
the number, uh, let's look at some structure of, um, of, um, that's present in the graph, uh, like maybe mean degree or something like this, right? The probability that a given individual has a degree. We can do something. Let, let, we'll, typically, you could do something more sophisticated than this, but I'll make it very simple. Um, one way of doing this is simply to say that, that let's, let's ask, if we had a, if, if the links were all just drawn at random, right, how different, right, would the graph look? Okay, so if I have a, a um, I can look at the number of, say, black-white links, and I can say, well, how differently would that, how different would that number be if I had drawn the graph at random? Well, obviously, the graph isn't going to be a Bernoulli graph, so we might want to draw the graph at random, subject to some constraints on the nature of the graph that we do have, and this would lead you to use some kind of exponential random graph. Exponential random graphs say draw a graph that is random as possible, entropy maximizing, subject to some constraints. And you specify those constraints, like the mean degree is this, uh, the mean geodesic length is that, and then you, you, know, and then you, you do this, right? Um, and so then you can make those kinds of comparisons that way. So in the simplest case I mentioned, you would just say, well, if we do a Bernoulli random graph, right, what is the fraction of black-white links we expect to have? What do we have in that graph? That would be a way of doing that. Right? Um, there, there is a recent paper, well, it's not so recent now, um, uh, by uh, Frederick Eschenik at Caltech and Roland Fryer at Harvard that talks about, um, uh, that takes an axiomatic approach to talking about measures of homophily. You can, I don't remember the, where it's published, but you can track it down. Those names are pretty unique. Um, and uh, pretty unique, that's a horrible thing to say. <laughs> Either are or are not unique. Okay. Um, the um, uh, another thing to do is to is to ask the question from an internal point of view, um, which is to say, if I look at a graph, can I identify a large graph? This doesn't make sense for a small graph, but I have a large graph, right? Uh, like a high school, can I identify community structure within that graph? Can I can I identify groups of people? that seem to communicate with each other, right? So think about your own, you know, um, say college experience, right? You know, there, there's this big graph that represents the connections that everybody has, but, um, you know, there are, there are you know, there, there's kind of clearly some kind of internal clustering. You hung out probably with a somewhat small group of individuals, right? And other people did the same. Can we, can we recover those kind of basic communities from from um, uh, graph data. And so this is a subject of intense research, um, much of it not being done by social scientists, but being done by, com by, by computer scientists who are paid by Facebook and Google, right, um, uh, to work on this kind of question, um, and taking very ad hoc approaches that we would all just tremble at, okay? Um, uh, and this problem of identifying community structure is very hard. Um, but it seems to me that, you know, what I would really like to do um, is to say I'd like to have a good model, of a good way of identifying community structure by looking at a graph and then saying, well, well, instead of just looking at individual links, I can identify these communities. Now, how integrated are these communities or these sub-communities, right? Um, and, 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 and we don't yet know how to do that, but that's clearly kind of a coming research program, right? Uh, I don't know if that helps. Okay. Um, so let me talk about uh, another property of, of another question you might want to ask of a graph. Let's think about, go back and think about, about, about um, Chris and Tim's farmers, okay? Um, some farmers are clearly more influential than other farmers. Some farmers are queried a lot. Other farmers are not queried very much, right? Is there a way of looking at a graph and figuring out who the central people are, okay? So a lot has been written about this both from um, uh, originally by sociologists and, and, and um, economists have jumped into the fray. They've not improved the situation very much. Um, there are some standard things to do. Um, and the sociologists thought of them first. So that's that. Um, so let's talk about some of these measures. Um, if I want to ask who are the powerful people in a social network, there are many potential answers to that question. Right? So one question is, Degree centrality, how many, how many uh, vertices can a given vertex directly reach? And you might guess that um, uh, if an individual, it is plausible to say that if an individual is connected to a lot of people, right, influences a lot of people, then that person is a powerful person, right, is a central person. Um, 
Fine, that's plausible. Here's something else that's plausible between this centrality and, and there, for every one of these things, there have been numerous empirical studies that have measured these things. Um, what is between the centrality? How likely is it that a vertex is on a geodesic, right? Um, between two randomly chosen people. So, so what does it mean to be central? It means to be that anything that flows between two people flows through me, right? That's what between the centrality measures. Um, um, closeness centrality. So let's look at the sum of the geodesic lengths uh, from me to everybody else in the network. The smaller that sum is, the closer I am to everybody. Okay? And that has been used. Um, uh, and then, uh, and, and, uh, and then uh, there's another measure which, so um, I've not seen too many papers um, uh, outside of the, you know, the Journal of Social Networks that, that use, that talk about things like betweenness and closeness centrality. Eigenvector centrality is, 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 is a very useful concept. Eigenvector centrality is something that basically drives Google. You might know this. Um, uh, and uh, um, the problem that Google faces when you put in a search query is what to give back to you, right? And, 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 um, uh, and it turns out, so what they do is they're interested in, thinking, well, let's look at, let's look at, 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 at uh, let's construct a network of, uh, of, of sites that, um, uh, that deal with your question, your query in some way, and then look, look at, let's look at sites that are central within that subnetwork of the web that we've created, okay, for your query. Um, and what does it mean to be central? Well, it means to be is eigenvector centrality is, 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 is essentially what they use. And this concept was floated much earlier in the sociology literature by, by Phil Bonisich, who's at, at UCLA. I think he's still there. Might have just retired. I'm not sure. Um, how much does a vertex influence? Uh, we can measure the importance of a vertex by asking how much it influences other important vertices. OK. Um, now that seems to be a bit of a recursive definition, right? So I am important if I influence other important vertices, but they are important, right? If they are influence other important vertices, this seems you know, like a little bit hard to untangle, um, and this turns out to be um, an eigenvector uh, problem, and so let's see why that's true. So, so let's just deal with our, um, let's suppose we have a directed graph so we have um, an adjacency matrix, which is to say just zeros and ones. And you can do this, by the way, for weighted adjacency matrices as well. Okay. Um, and we're going to do a little bit of analytic work here. Um, uh, so we're going to have a, a, a vector, uh, a, a matrix of zeros and ones. And what is degree centrality? So degree centrality, we can write degree centrality. What is degree centrality? Degree centrality for a given i is just the, um, uh, actually, I guess I've done this for J's. And there's a reason why I've done it for J's. Let's take a given individual J, and we're going to, we, the way we've written this matrix is we say that, that um, 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 is what I've set up here, is that Aij is equal to 1 if J influences I. OK? All right, and so let's remember that. So, so um, what is the degree centrality for individual j? We just sum over the i's such that aij is equal to 1, right? So if I just take the column sum, right, and I sum up all those 1's, right, there is an ij, uh, ij equals 1 for every edge between an i and a j. So the column sum, right, for individual j uh, is just that, is, is, is the degree of, of individual j. And so we can write that as e times a, where e is the vector of all ones. OK? Everybody happy? OK. Um, by the way, no fixed point theorems today, OK? So not to worry. Um, uh, so here's a notion of centrality that was introduced by a guy named Katz back in the 1950s. OK? Um, and uh, his idea is, um, I want to, so let's, let's think about this in stages. Suppose I have my matrix A, okay? So, um, chalk, okay? Let's look at the matrix product, the ij element of A. Can you all see that? 
Is that too, is that too low? Okay. So the, what is this? Let's just write this out. This is the sum of a i k a k j. Okay. This is since since a is since every one of these numbers is either zero or one, right? Um, every monomial here is either zero or one, and so this is going to be an integer of some kind, right? It is only a one if both um, uh, i k is one and k j is one. If i k is 1 and a k j is 1, what do we have? We have a path of length 2 from i to j. i to k, k to j. So what is this sum, summing over all k's? This is the sum of all paths of length 2 between i and j. Anybody want to guess what a cubed is? Right, length 3 paths and a n length n paths, right? Okay. So Katz's idea said, well, um, one thing that matters is who do I talk to directly? That's A. Another thing that matters is who do I talk to at a distance 2 from me? That's A squared. And so on. OK. Right. But my influence declines with distance. OK. So um, um, <clears throat> let, us, let us discount that. OK. He didn't use the word discounting, but that's what he did. OK. All right, and this, by the way, keeps going. Right? He actually looked at an infinite sum. Now, why is the inf infinite sum interesting? I think the infinite sum is interesting because um, um, what does this reflect? So one thing it reflects, if I look at the relationship between i and j, um, there is going to be um, uh, two things that are interesting. One is that there's going to be multiple ways right, that information can reach me from i to j. Okay? And, um, uh, uh, and uh, so there'll be paths, and there'll be paths of different length. But I might actually be getting influence from J both at, you know, both uh, one step away from me because I'm influenced by somebody who is influenced by J, and maybe at two steps because I'm influenced by somebody who's influenced by somebody who's influenced by J, and so on and so forth. Okay? So that's one thing we want to record. The other thing we want to take account of is that there's an echo effect. Right? The echo effect is that J might be influenced by me, so at some distance, okay, um, uh, what I am getting back is a little piece of my own influence, okay? Um, and uh, all of that, and, 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 and that is, again, reflected in this, in this matrix construction, okay? So what's actually nice about this, so this is what, 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 what Katz actually wanted to look at. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and that's um, uh, Katz centrality. I will call it Katz centrality. Um, and uh, so it's very tempting um, to, do, uh, to do one more thing, and that, that is let's just add on to everybody's vector a. Um, so if I just take this, whatever this is, right, and I mul pre multiply by e, I'm now getting a column vector, I'm, I'm sorry, getting a row vector, right, um, which, is, which is, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, column sums from this big, ex you know, expansion. Okay, it's tempting to do one more thing, which is to say it's just to add a one for yourself. And if you add a one for yourself, then what do we get? We get this. Okay, right. And what is that? That's just the the um, the von Neumann series expansion of i minus alpha a inverse. Okay. And you know, the, the question that you should have asked when I wrote this down, I'm sure you all did ask in your minds, but were just too polite to ask me, was, well, does this converge? Um, and, uh, uh, and the answer is, um, for a small enough alpha, it will converge. Um, and uh, we'll see a little bit more about that in just a second. So what is this really? This is really E times I minus alpha A inverse. OK. Um, and so this is the cat centrality measure for those alphas for which this inverse exists. Okay. Um, and um, 
Now, one problem with this is that, that one thing you might want to do is you might want to think about, to look at a network, you might want to ask the question, well, what happens if I change alpha you know, and look at different values of alpha? What happens if alpha is very big? What happens if alpha is very small? So on and so forth. And, and um, one problem with this is that, is that um, uh, these are all, uh, these matrices have a largest eigen, you know, how many of you know the perron frobenius theorem? You should all know the perron frobenius theorem. It's a wonderful thing. And I see that no one knows what the perron frobenius theorem is. Am I right? This is really horrible. Okay. Non-negative square matrices. Okay. The, um, uh, if you have a non-negative square matrix um, under some additional properties, um, which will be satisfied for what we care about. The following is true. Um, the maximum modulus eigenvalue is real and positive, and the eigenspace corresponding to that has dimension one, and that eigenspace is spanned by a strictly positive vector. Okay, and the um, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, that positive eigenvalue is the largest alpha for which this sum will converge. For an alpha bigger than that, the sum will diverge. So what happens is that as alpha is getting nearer and nearer to this positive eigenvalue, this sum is getting infinite, is getting ever larger, and it's and in this and or you know this vector over here is getting ever ever larger. So it really is hard to do comparisons. So a natural thing to do, as it turns out, is to just multiply by one minus a. This is not stuff that he did. And if you do this, right, this is now bounded within the range. Or uh, uh, actually, this should be. Lambda minus a, where lambda is this largest eigenvalue, it's bounded, um, and so now it's sensible to actually compare um, uh, relative values of my centrality versus your centrality for different for different uh, values of alpha. So, um, all right. So these things are all connected. So let's talk about eigenvector centrality. Eigenvector centrality says that the centrality of individual j is proportional to the sum of the centralities of the nodes that I influence, OK? So what that says is that um, I've, the first equation on the left just says that, OK? And I see that there is a, a missing e. That should be c super e sub i times a i j, OK? That is the mathematical expression of the sentence preceding it, OK? And you can see what does that say. That says that c is a is a left eigenvector of A, OK? So that's eigenvector centrality, all right? Um, now, um, uh, what do I mean by a matrix being strongly connected? There is a path from any, from any vertex to any other vertex, OK? So basically, there's only one, one strong, uh, there's a path from any vertex to any other vertex, OK? Um, for directed graphs, we talk about 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 um, uh, matri about about a graph being weakly and strongly connected. Weakly connected means throw away the arrows and see if it's connected as a uh, in dire under ignoring direction. Okay, and then the other thing, strongly connected, means that there's actually a path that I can walk from any to from one node to another. Okay, um, uh, and um, uh, if the graph and and so we're largely interested in strongly connected. Um, networks because otherwise we can study each component, strongly connected component, piece by piece. Okay, and so um, we're just going to pretend that we have one, and um, uh, and this expression um, leads us to an eigenvalue problem or an eigen yeah an eigenvalue problem. So now, which eigenvalue would you choose? Well, the natural one to choose is the one that is guaranteed to give you a positive eigenvector and for which the constant of proportionality is positive and real because a complex eigenvector wouldn't, make, wouldn't be able to interpret and a negative eigenvector would be expressing, a, a negative eigenvalue would be expressing exactly the wrong thing, right? So um, uh, now it's possible that you could, and, and oh yeah, the perron frobenius theorem says there's only one positive eigenvalue as well, uh, positive real eigenvalue, and it's the one of largest magnitude. So that's the one that we look at. And this is an idea which, as I said, is due to Phil Bonasic, who's a sociologist at UCLA. And um, these things are all connected. Um, and I've done all these nice calculations here. Um, I'm going to, um, uh, uh, for a moment, I'm going to assume that I, we're looking at a weighted matrix. OK, um, so pretend that, that instead of having zeros and ones, I have zeros and positive weights. 
And let me just suppose, and I'm thinking about this in the context of the linear and means model. Um, because this would be true in the linear and means model. Remember, all the row sums are one, um, right? So that the, the weight in any row, the weights in any row sum to one, okay? Um, and in that case, it turns out, right, in the linear and means model, one is the maximal eigenvalue, and the corresponding eigenvector is the vector of all ones, right? Or a corresponding one. And you can do some calculations here, and you can see that from these calculations, which are not really interesting to talk uh, to look at, um, is uh, there's a typo here because this should be lambda and that should be lambda. Okay, um, but basically what happens as we think about our our modified cat's eigenvector centrality measure. I'm sorry, our modified cat's centrality measure, where we're looking at one minus alpha times e times uh, uh, um, you know, times I minus alpha A inverse, okay? When we let alpha get very large, as it converges to the eigenvalue, the, the Perron eigenvalue, um, we are, our, our centrality measure converges to the Bonisich centrality measure. And as we let uh, alpha gets very small, as it converges to zero, we are converging to degree centrality, okay? Uh, and we have to subtract off one, and then we get degree centrality. Okay, and so um, alpha essentially measures here the dis you know the the effects of these different path lengths, um, and um, eigenvector centrality makes sense um, if you believe that that all paths are equally important for determining diffusion. Okay, um, and degree centrality makes sense. If you believe that um, uh, that um, influence dies away almost immediately, and the in-between things um, all correspond to different values of our modified Katz measure, okay. Now, why might we actually care about this in a? Um, um, uh, and I think just to summarize this, this okay. Um, I guess there's one more point, and this is, uh, again, another idea that Phil Bonisich had, is that there are actually two sources of centrality. One is your position in the network, and the other is what you're bringing to the table, right? So if you are in a position that is intrinsically influen influential in the network, but you don't contribute anything to the discussion, you're not influential, right? And on the other hand, if you have, um, if you contribute a lot, even from a relatively extreme position, you can have influence. And so he suggested what he calls alpha centrality. So I should have used a different thing here, um, which is uh, um, this thing, that your centrality is a weighted sum of your cat centrality plus an additional term, which is some he described it as being um, an inherited social status. Suppose you had some external social status, and he wants to interpret in this article that I read in different settings, it means different things, centrality is status. He says that suppose that um, your status is due to your position in the network and something external, and now we're led to this, to this um, notion, um, uh, which looks pretty interpretable to us. It's D times I minus alpha A inverse, and um, this connects up in obvious ways to other centrality measures that we've talked about. So these things are all interrelated. The literature is not very clear on making out what these relationships are. Um, sociologists have provided many different interpretations for these measures, and interpretations, in fact, depend upon context, what we think the network is doing. So let me give you an example about why you might care about centrality, okay? Um, you have a question? No, okay. So I want to imagine a game. Um, and this is essentially a game that will give rise to, to a generalization of the linear and means model, right? Every individual has to choose something, um, a behavior of some kind, maybe an effort or a, um, um, I don't know, some kind of choice. And we're gonna measure that choice on the real line. So a strategy for an individual in our end player game um, is going to be a real number, okay? Um, and our individual gets, we don't have a pointer, do we? Oh, we do. I'm really dangerous with these things. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, that wasn't good. Um, 
Okay. Um, uh, okay, if I'm really careful, I can do this. Okay. Utility um, actually has two components. Component number one, this is a nice quadratic thing here, which says that there is an optimal thing that I would do. Um, that's this piece is the private component. If I were on my own, if this thing were not, if that were not there, I'm erasing it now, if it weren't there, and I only had the private component, I would choose to do HI. That would be my natural choice, right? I would maximize HI XI minus XI squared over two by choosing XI equal to HI, okay? But there's also a social component. I, compare, I care about matching my, the average of my friend's behavior, okay? And the, weight, the marginal rate of substitution between the private and the social component is beta over two. Notice, so I'm measuring distance quadratically, and the minus sign means that the farther away I am, the worse off I am. Average, well, I've got a weighted adjacency matrix here. I've got a AI, AIJ is the weight that individual I puts on J, the degree to which J influences him, the degree to which J counts in the average, okay? Um, and so um, uh, this is, a spe and I've now nicely specified a very simple game, right? Good one for qualifying exams, okay? Um, uh, what is the Nash equilibrium? The Nash equilibrium is unique, um, and uh, it's useful to reparametrize by changing this beta, the strength of the social component relative to the private component, to reparametrize it this way is beta over one plus beta, um, and when you do, you get this very nice expression. And this tells you what everybody is doing, okay? So now let's ask the question, um, 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 what is the average play in the population? So this is a natural question to ask if you're doing empirical work. What is the average from this game? Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this row vector x, and I'm just going to pre-multiply it. Well, I've written it as a row vector, so I should have put the e on the other side. Um, well, in any way, this works out to be the right answer, so hold on. Um, no, actually, this is a column vector. X is a column vector, the way I've done this, because I'm post-multiplying by H, yes. X is a column vector. This is what individuals are doing, okay? Um, I pre-multiply it by the matrix E of ones and divide by N. Um, so this is the average in the population, and you do the calculation, and you get this nice answer that average in the population um, is is uh, basically the cats, this, this our, our, our modified centrality measure times the, uh, which is a row vector, times the vector H of, um, of uh, individuals' uh, own private choices. And so now you can actually see the trade-off between private choices and, uh, um, and, and positional power in the determination of average behavior of the population. The larger, um, uh, the larger your centrality or the larger um, your H, okay, your own individual choice, the larger your, the, the larger, uh, the, the bigger the, um, I'm sorry, the more influence, I'm saying this the wrong way. Let me sit, start again. What I want to say is the larger your centrality the larger your marginal influence on the average is, okay? The larger your centrality, okay, the, um, uh, the greater is, um, um, uh, the greater is, um, uh, um, is the effect of a change in your own private type, your own private best choice on the behavior of the average, uh, of the, the behavior of the entire population. When phi is equal to zero, right, uh, this is uh, just a, 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 a matrix of ones, and all you're doing is just averaging everybody, and your effect is one over n, right? Um, but that effect can be greater or less than one, depending upon your position, as soon as there's social influence, okay? Um, so this is just meant to show how, in a very simple economic model, right, um, um, a uh, useful measure of centrality um, actually plays out for something that we might care about, namely um, an economic output uh, outcome from whatever um, you might choose to describe. Now, models exactly like this have been used um, uh, to study, for example, peer effects in education where this is effort choice by students, okay? Um, now, of course, typically, um, 
Uh, if you wanted to think about this as effort choice, you would say, well, zero is a lower bound to effort. Uh, but somehow people who do this kind of thing never worry about those lower bounds. All right. Um, uh, and then when they, but they throw in a normal error term here somewhere in the quadratic part. So, um, but this is a, basically a, 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 a theoretical model that generates as its outcome the um, linear, so, uh, the, um, a version of the linear and means model. It would be exactly the linear and means model if the AIJs, um, if this was a, a matrix with, uh, const, with, const, with either zeros, well, you know the matrix, it's either zero or one over n, where one over n is, n is adjusted so that the row sum is, is, is one. Okay, homophily. Um, um, I took these quotations from a paper of Stephen Durloff's because I expected him to be here. Uh, uh, and he writes papers with epigraphs like this, um, which are harder to read than the paper, although oftentimes not very much harder to read than the paper. Um, so this is a, 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 a different view of Chicago. Now, you all know the Chicago neighborhood map, right? that was constructed by sociologists in the 20s, where Chicago was essentially divided up into these neighborhoods, and these neighborhoods really have taken on identity outside of academia, right? And so people talk about living you know, in, in neighborhoods with all these different Lincoln Park and places like that, right? All right, so um, this is a map that's constructed in an interesting way. Um, uh, colors represent ethnicities, okay? And what these, the guy who constructed this map did is that uh, there is a dot of a given color. A dot, a, a location on the map is colored by the average of the 20 nearest houses. Uh, I'm 10 or 20, I think it's 10. The average of the 10 nearest houses around it, okay? Um, and what you see here, um, uh, you know, you can identify some common features of Chicago in this map, right? So here's O'Hare. Right? Um, uh, this is I-55. Um, you know, there's like where we were last night um, and uh, so on and so forth. There's floating around down in that mess. And what, you know, what you can see is that, gee, this is really, you know, these boundaries are kind of sharp, right? So, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, blues are black, uh, uh, yellow is Hispanic, um, uh, pink is white. Um, and you know the boundary. And the thing to take away from this picture is that boundary lines are sharp. I have another map which I wish I had put into the slide pack, which is not here, which does the same thing where houses are where houses are graded by income. Okay. And what you see is that boundary lines are not sharp for income, right? That the income map is much more diffuse. And that's an interesting fact to think about. Why would that be true? Right. If anyone interested in urban economics, write that down. Okay. Um, Homophily, again, homophily is this idea that we connect with people who we like, who are like us, not who we like, but we connect with people who are like us. Um, what are sources of homophily, right? Um, uh, there are two theories that come out of, from, from different sociologists. One is something that could be called status homophily. Uh, we feel more comfortable when we interact with others who share a similar cultural background uh, similar status in our eyes to us, value homophily. We often feel justified in our opinions when we are surrounded by others who share the same beliefs. Um, these have been written about extensively, and one thing to take away from this, again, is that what would count as similarity is clearly going to be contextually independent, uh, contextually dependent, okay? Um, um, uh, you know, I... I you know, I might go to church and talk nicely with people who have very different values than me, but we share this common cultural background, okay? Um, actually, I don't go to church, I go to synagogue, and I have exactly this issue. My values are very different in key dimensions from many of my fellow uh, participants, but uh, we are all very friendly with each other. We even interdine, okay? Um, uh, but, um, uh, but value homophily comes out in different contexts, okay? Um, what sociologists don't write about, but which should be the first thing that comes to mind for economists, is what I have labeled here as opportunity homophily. Um, in constructing social networks, search is costly, right? Um, you are, in fact, constrained right, in who you can have links with by the set of people that you actually interact with in some way, right? Or interact with enough to form a social relationship, okay? Um, so there are obvious natural constraints. Um, you're mostly going to, you know, you see homophily, therefore, because most of the people we work with, you guys are going to know a lot of economists in your life, sorry. 
you know, so it goes. Um, um, all right, I'm not going to talk about this to save time. Um, how many of you have heard that obesity is contagious? Okay, well, this is that, okay? This is a graph that comes from the Christakis Fowler paper, okay, the, the one in Nature. And, um, um, and basically, they looked at Framingham, the, the Framingham heart data, which is a famous data set that's been collected since the 1940s, a gigantic panel. And what they also, they got some, I guess, along with it comes some data on friendship in more recent waves. And what they discovered is that people who are obese um, tend to have links to people who are obese, okay? Uh, and, um, and then they drew some, some, some uh, conclusions from this that um, basically that um, um, relating to obese people causes you to become more obese. Chuck Mansky's comment on this to me, well, I'm going to say it, and Chuck is not a private person this way, so I, don't, I feel comfortable saying this, is say, I don't see how anything is identified here, okay, in this work. And Stephen um, has a former student named Ethan Cohen Cole, who wrote a very nice paper with another co-author that took this, data set, took this study just apart in pieces. And when this came out, it was very, you know, it got all kinds, it, it got the New York Times, right? Um, you know, it got, it got nature. There was also, I think, the same project generated. It got a double bite, a double sound bite, because it got science as well, right? Um, and um, so um, uh, it's kind of how not to do social interaction research. Um, but. Um, uh, it's, and the uh, Cohen Cole's paper is, I think, in my references, so you can find it. Let me talk about labor markets. All right. Um, we all know um, that there's a, 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 a wage inequality. Um, I, I don't have to present this group with data on that. You know where to find it if you want. Um, um, one source of inequality has to do with the opportunities that you have for jobs. Okay. Um, and um, the jobs that you can have are constrained a number of ways. Um, one way in which they're constrained is what jobs are you qualified for? What jobs are even in your perceptual set would you even think of having? Okay. Um, uh, another way in which jobs are constrained is that job search is hard, it's costly, um, and you maybe are, are, you perhaps are constrained in what jobs you can find. And it may well be the case that people um, different people can find different jobs. So that two similarly qualified individuals, one might become aware of a job and another not, right? So the job search mechanism can be a source of inequality, okay? So why do we believe that this is true, okay? So here are a number of studies um, um, here, starting in 51, 1970, 1974, 1980, Okay, spanning, spanning uh, uh, you know, what, a third of a decade, okay, um, uh, and they, uh, all these things talk about for different kinds of jobs, um, how did you find out about the job? And uh, what we see by, in looking at all, so we have friends and relatives just kind of sending an application over the transom, so to speak, um, through an employment agency, through ads, through some other way, um, and the key thing to notice here is that, wow, this column is really big, okay? Um, you know, compared to, uh, you know, compared to uh, everything else. Um, uh, and uh, it sure seems that a lot of people find jobs um, through friends or relatives, okay? Um, and so I want to talk about that um, uh, for just a bit, okay? Um, and uh, so here's an area um, which has been studied in particular by one sociologist, Mark Granovetter at Stanford. Um, and I think that this has influenced a number of economists in how they think about, um, how they think about uh, 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 job search. Unfortunately, it has not influenced guys who do macro labor. Who in here is going to do macro labor? I would presume that if macro is part of a description, you wouldn't be in this room. Right? But um, uh, the macro labor guys do these job search models that don't look terribly searchy to me. Um, so um, uh, the, um, uh, this idea actually started in Granovetter's thesis, actually. Um, and uh, he wrote a book called Getting a Job, which is worth taking a look at. Um, and he distinguishes um, uh, two kinds of ties, two kinds of links 
Um, he said that there are those people that we know very well, that we interact with all the time, so on and so forth. We're going to call these things um, strong, uh, strong ties or strong links, okay? He said, then there's um, a web of acquaintanceship that we have, people that we see only occasionally, people that we have a rather limited connection with, okay? Um, and we're going to call these weak links. Um, and here he has a little bit of a discussion about, um, uh, about what the difference between strong end link is and how one might operationalize these for measurement purposes, okay? Um, and, um, uh, and this, by the way, comes from his book. Uh, no, it doesn't. It comes from his article, uh, which is either in ASR, AJS, I don't remember which. Okay. Um, so why might link, weak links matter? Okay. So I want to tell a story about linking here. Um, and let me catch up with myself just a minute. Um, okay. Um, So Granovetter, I'm going to kind of build you a little piece of a, of a model that Granovetter talks through. He says, the hypothesis which enables us to relate dyadic ties to larger structures is the stronger the tie between A and B, the larger the proportion of individuals uh, to whom they will both be tied. That is connected by either a weak, a a weak or a strong tie. Um, this overlap in their friendship is Circles is predicted to be least when the tie is absent, most of when it's strong, and intermediate when it's weak. It is sufficient for my purposes in this paper to say that the triad which is most unlikely to occur under the hypothesis stated above is that in which A and B are strongly tied. A has a strong tie to a friend C, but the tie between C and B um, is absent. Okay? So what he's saying is that is that if we have a triad, okay, A, B, C, if we have, I'm sorry, if we have three individuals, A, B, and C, and if A and B are connected by a strong link, and B and C are connected by any link, then it is more likely, right, then um, it is more likely than not that, that A and C will be connected in some kind of link, okay? Um, so, so, um, um, this is kind of an elaboration of the idea of transitivity. So the transitivity is more likely when it involves a strong link um, than when it doesn't involve a strong link. That's, his, that's, his, that's a basic idea. So let's see how that plays out. So here we have two cliques, right? We have, the a, we have a clique with A and we have a clique with B, all right? Um, oops. Oh, there we go. Um, so now what I've done is I've drawn a link between A and B. And in the parlance of uh, sociolo some sociologists who study social networks, they would call this a bridge between A and B, okay? Um, uh, and um, um, now I think the thing to, to, to um, we call it a bridge because it's the only connection between these two cliques, okay? So now we have two clusters between these two cliques, or two links now between these two cliques. Um, but... Um, uh, we can still think of these as being like bridges. We can call them local bridges. Why are they bridge-like? Okay, because um, uh, because uh, the two endpoints of these two red lines have, um, for each red line, that's the way to say it. For each red line, the two endpoints have no friends in common. Okay, so for example, here B and A have no friends in common. Here, let's call that C, that D. C and D have no friends in common, okay, um, um, except for each other. So these are, are, are still bridge-like, okay? Um, so um, now let's, let's fill in the, um, uh, the graph um, with um, uh, S's and W's in somewhat arbitrary way, okay, subject to basically one constraint. And that constraint is, is that a length two path contain, containing only strong edges is a closed triad, okay? So suppose that if I'm strongly connected to you and you're strongly connected to him, then I'm going to be strong, I'm going to be connected to him in some way, okay? So that's kind of even a strengthening or a, 
of, of the hypothesis, or it, it's a sharper version. Well, I guess it's a less version, binding version of the hypothesis that I talked about earlier. And if we look at that labeling, we see that, that these local bridges have to be weak. So here there is, from A to this guy, there is a strong, there is a strong link. Okay? So if our triadic closure, if our triadic closure hypothesis were to be maintained and this were to be strong, then this is edge would have that I'm sketching here would have to be there. Okay? So the fact that if this is going to be a local bridge, it has to be weak, because otherwise you'd have a strong strong. Okay? Um, and um, and this is the point, okay? The point is, is that ties, and Granovetter's point is, that ties that stretch to far domains of the social structure are likely to be weak ties. And, 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 and people that are nearer to us in many ways, those are more likely to be strong ties. Now, why is this interesting for, for uh, job search? The reason why it ought to be interesting for job search is that what do I do when I look for a job? Right? According to the previous table, first thing I do, and what you will all be doing at some point in your life, when, not when you're looking for your second job for sure, maybe even for your first, is you'll be asking your friends. Right? Well, you know, you're going to be looking for jobs yourself by looking at ads and asking you know, all around and all of that. And then you're going to ask people who are close to you, and they're going to give you information. But the information that they're going to have is going to be light, is likely to be the same information that you have because they know largely the same people that you know, right? So, you know, you can't you can't ask your you know your best friend who's in the same field you are and you live together in graduate school and all that because you're not going to get any different information. Okay, who are you going to get information from? You're going to get information from somebody who you you drank with one night at a conference, right? They're the person who's going to know about an opening that you hadn't heard about otherwise, right? That's the importance. Okay, um, of, of, of weak ties. Now, um, um, there's a lot of empirical work, actually, that backs that up. There's empirical work that has been done a lot of it. So Granovetter actually documents this in his, in his thesis and in subsequent work. Okay, it's been studied by a number of economists in different countries. Just a couple of years ago, for example, there was a paper done about Russian labor markets. Um, uh, I saw a paper involving uh, Nan Lin, who we were talking about earlier, who did this for Chinese labor markets. Okay? So economists and sociologists both have looked at this and have found that, uh, um, uh, that this idea under appropriate definition of what's a strong, what's a weak tie, seems to be a powerful idea that, what is it that seems to be a powerful idea that weak ties actually um, um, are generative for jobs? that people tend to find jobs that are... Uh, the other thing that Granovetter did, by the way, was he said um, he actually would go to... Uh, he studied people who lived in Newton, Massachusetts, which is a rather you know, well-to-do suburb of Boston. Um, and he asked people in, you know, in Newton, where did they get their job from? How did they hear about it? And then he would go to the person from whom they heard about it um, and said, well, did, you know, how, did you, how do you know about this job? And typically, they heard about it from somebody else. Okay, but the path length was short. Okay, um, and um, and, it, and he documents that it turns out that his definition of weak ties, which had to do with how often did you see somebody during a year, um, uh, it turned out that those ties were the most generative of jobs. Okay, um, now how what 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 are the implications of this? Fine. So now I've described something about the search process. And you could imagine writing papers that would just stop with that. Now I've taught you something about labor search. But the next thing to do is to say, well, what are the implications of that for a labor market? Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about a paper by Jim Montgomery. Um, uh, I mentioned yesterday that I knew of a guy who is an economist who turned into a sociologist so he could lower his salary. Um, and that's Jim Montgomery. Has a PhD from Northwestern. His first job was at Wisconsin in the economics department. Second job was in the sociology department. I think he actually has a joint appointment. Um, um, but he now he's uh, largely you know kind of living in the sociology world. Um, um, so, but he back in the 1990s um, actually uh, uh, wrote a model. This is not a strong weak tie model. You could do the strong weak tie thing. But he wrote down a model to show how um, search through friends can influence labor market outcomes. Okay? 
Um, and um, uh, so let me describe the model. Uh, well, so the, the point is to show how different, um, we might imagine different ways, or, or, or uh, we might imagine that people might get a job by going to an anonymous labor market, or they might get a job through a referral. He shows how parameters of the referral process can have an impact on the distribution of wages, right? So clearly, um, uh, 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 this kind of thing is important for thinking about inequality, um, uh, even though this is a, a, a toy model. Um, so here's the model that he talks about. Workers live for two periods. Number of workers is the same in both periods. Um, we have two types of workers. We have productive workers and um, not productive workers. The high productive workers produce one. Um, uh, low productive workers produce zero. And workers are observationally indistinguishable. Okay. Um, now every firm, it's a very stripped down market. Every firm employs one worker. Okay. And therefore, profits to the firm are simply going to be employee productivity minus the wage. So that if you hire a good worker at wage W, your profits are 1 minus W. If you've hired a bad worker at wage W, your profits are just minus W. You've lost money. Okay. We're going to imagine that there's free entry into this, into this market, um, free entry of firms, so that we'll have a zero expected profit condition as an equilibrium condition in the market. And we're going to assume, by the way, in order to get that, we also have to assume that entrepreneurs are risk neutral. Okay. Um, so we're going to have firms are going to, in equilibrium, firms are going to have expected uh, profit of zero, and wage offers are going to reflect, to some degree, expected productivity. And that's what we're going to see. So um, now let's get to the social structure part. Um, each worker knows, each worker at date one knows, um, so what's going to happen is that you work for one period and then you retire and then your firm hires a worker for the second period and then the world ends, okay? Um, um, uh, so each uh, time one worker knows at most one time two worker. Each time one worker has a social tie, which is to say he knows somebody with probability tau. So that's going to be a parameter of our model. How likely is a given uh, type, uh, a given time one worker, a given first period worker, going to know anybody in the second period? Now, a second parameter to ask is, what's the person that you know like? So with probability alpha, which we're going to take to be greater than 1 half, that worker is the same type as you. So there's going to be hom homophily in productivity. right? If alpha is very high, it's almost sure that any friend of yours, any young friend of yours, you're all old, and I'm like out of the model, okay? Um, uh, that uh, any um, young friend of yours uh, is going to be productive. On the other hand, if alpha is very near one half, it's essentially your friends are random draws, all right? So alpha is measuring the degree of homophily, all right? Um, uh, so we've now got these, these um, um, uh, uh, and 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 um, uh, so we have these two parameters. Tau measures network density. How likely is it that an old person knows a young person? And alpha measures what we might call and what he called inbreeding bias, which we really should have called homophily bias or something like that. Uh, here's the timing of the model. Um, uh, firms hire work period one workers through the anonymous market, and the market clears at some wage rate M1. Production occurs, and when production occur, occurs, each firm learns its workers' productivity. Okay. Um, now, um, uh, firm um, a given firm then turns to his worker and he says. Um, you know, if you have a friend, I am willing to pay that friend some amount, a referral wage uh, uh, for a second period worker. So if you have a friend and you want to nominate him, I'll pay him amount WRF, okay? Um, social ties have been assigned at some point, I said here, but it could have been done anywhere. Um, um, and now the time one workers relay the uh, offer to time two workers. By the way, RWF could be minus infinity, okay? Namely, like, don't bother. All right, that's a possibility here. Um, time two workers decide they get their referral offer. If, they, if, they are, if a time two worker is, is connected to a time one worker, he looks at the referral offer, 
and decides whether or not to accept it. If he doesn't accept it, he enters the anonymous market. Anybody who doesn't get a referral offer because they don't happen to be a friend of a period one guy also goes directly to the anonymous market, and then production occurs and the world is over. That's a simple model. This is published in the AER. Okay? Simple models can have legs. All right. Um, uh, only firms with, uh, so, so what's equilibrium going to look like? Okay. Um, so first, actually, let's imagine what would happen if nobody were connected to anybody else, right? If nobody were connected to anybody else, the first period wage rate um, 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 would be, let's see, I think, I think the way that this is set up was that, um, um, uh, I should have said this at the outset, that half the workers are of type 1, half the workers are of type 2, okay? Um, uh, I'm sorry, half the workers are productive, half the workers are not productive. So then the expected wage rate would equal 1 half. Right? Um, and then in the second period, since there's no information about the workers, no one's connected to anybody, everybody goes to the labor market, it's one half. Right? That would be the simple equilibrium. What happens with social structure? Okay. Well, the first thing that's going to happen with social structure is that the anonymous market wage in the second period is going to be equal to one half. It's going to be less than one half. Why is that? Because referral, you know, if, let's suppose that, that um, you know, we know that alpha is greater than one half. Right? Workers that are referred by strong workers, I'm a firm, you're my good worker, so I know that your friend is, has probability greater than one half of being a good worker, okay? You refer him, okay? You're a good, and you are now more like, I, in my eyes, you are more likely to be a good worker, but there's free entry here, right? Free entry late condition is going to be that I'm going to end up offering you some wage which is greater than one half. All right. Um, anonymous workers, Right? Um, so what does that mean? Who's going to be left over for the anonymous market? Right? The anonymous market is going to be more filled with type 0 workers than with type 1 workers. Right? And obviously, by the way, um, um, in the circumstance that, that uh, um, um, uh, referral uh, uh, in equilibrium, in the equilibrium I'm describing, uh, 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 if I have a bad worker, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to pay anybody. I'm going to rather go to the anonymous market. Okay, um, so in equilibrium, the anonymous market is going to be more filled with bad workers than with good workers, and therefore the expected productivity of such a worker is going to be less than one half. So I'm going to offer a lower wage to those guys. Okay, um, that means that it's going to be good to have friends. Um, uh, profits in the uh, in the in, in, if we had no social structure, uh, profits in both periods would be zero. But now what's going to happen is that profits in the second period, expected profits are going to be positive, okay, in the second period. Um, what is going to happen in the first period? That's a little more interesting. What is the value of a productive worker? The value of a productive worker is not just the value of what the worker produces, but it's also the value of the worker that the, um, that the first worker, um, uh, that, the, that, the, that the worker provides to the firm, okay? Um, a, uh, a good worker can make a referral that will be better than the market referral, um, and that's a good thing, right? And that's so in equilibrium, okay? Uh, uh, good uh, in equilibrium, the anonymous market wage is going to be greater than one half, okay? Um, and um, so uh, we now see that search has actually had some effect on the on the market outcomes, okay? Now more to the point. What do comparative statics look like? Right? What happens when we change the nature of social relationships? So, uh, and the comparative statics work the same way for both variables. Um, uh, um, what happens is that uh, we're going to inc increasing alpha, the the uh, degree of homophily, or increasing network density, the fraction of workers with ties, um, uh, has two effects. Um, I mean, has, has, has several effects. They all work in the same direction. Number one um, is that the, the, the uh, first period worker is now going to be more valuable, and so um, uh, if he's good, um, because he's more likely to have a tie, or that tie is more likely to be better, okay? And consequently, the market wage is going to increase when we increase either one of those parameters. Um, profits in the second period. By the way, it's important to say that, that profits in the second period are... are, 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 are there's another thing that's going on here that the second period, um, 
Uh, the second period wage rate is actually, uh, it's a distribution of wages. And this is not something I'm going to talk about, but um, uh, he talks about it. There was a large literature in the 90s that said, how could you get a, a distribution, actually late 80s, but how could you get a distribution of wages out of a simple market? And with monopoly, it turns out there's some monopoly power in this, in this market um, because a uh, given second period worker um, might get multiple referrals. I haven't said that every second period worker has only one friend. I've said that every first period worker has only one friend, but every second period worker, a given second period worker could have multiple friends, and so he gets to choose the best offer, okay? And that's gonna lead to a distribution of referral wages, not a single wage. So the equilibrium will involve some randomization here. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, and because of that, there's the possibility for positive profits in the second period, and positive and profits will go up in the second period. Um, WR is the, actually the top referral wage. The top referral wage will actually go up in that distribution. And of course, what happens is that with either better workers or, or, or um, better, I'm sorry, with, with either one of these parameters increasing, the, um, uh, the uh, anonymous market gets more filled with bad workers and consequently the um, market wage in the second period goes down. So what happens is that, is that more social structure in this sense, increasing either one of these parameters actually increases the spread of um, wages between good and bad workers in the second period, okay? Um, bad, all, you know, basically a worker, um, a, a bad worker can get a nice referral offer because it might be the case that he happens to have a good friend from the first period. Um, but as we increase the social structure in the census described, um, that is less likely to happen. It's more likely that he's going to get kicked into the anonymous market where he's going to get a lower wage, okay? And that wage gap, of course, is, is, is increasing. So we see here how social structure generates inequality. Um, all right, so enough of this. Um, um, okay. Um, all right, I'm gonna skip talking about estimation. Um, let me use the remaining amount of my time to make a connection with what Scott talked about. Um, um, Scott talked about, uh, you know, from, from an engineering point of view, how do we assign students to schools, okay? Um, there are, uh, and I think that Scott mentioned this yesterday, there are several different kinds of matching models um, uh, that, that people talk about. There is what is called um, non-transferable utility matching. That's actually a bad phrase. It really should be called matching without exchange, okay? Matching without exchange is that you get assigned to a school, but there's no quid pro quo. All right. There's no other good that's flowing back. It's just an assignment problem. It's a two-sided assignment problem because both people have preferences. Then there is matching with exchange. And a particular case of matching with exchange is called transferable utility matching. How many of you have heard of transferable utility matching? A few of you have. Okay, we're going to have a quick primer on transferable utility matching. Um, and transferable utility matching is matching where the match generate, where, where uh, you match up with somebody and then you get a side payment for the match and your utility is linear in side payments. All right? So, for example, let's think of a labor market. We have a worker and a firm, right? and they make a match and it generates some revenues and then the worker gets some payment out of that and the firm gets some profits out of that and both worker and firm have payoff functions that are linear in dollars, all right? That's transferable utility matching. A third case which is in between is where the payoff, where people get a payoff but their utility is not linear. So we don't have transferable utility but we still have exchange, okay? Um, and there are papers on that as well, not that many. So. Um, it might be a profitable area to think about. So let's talk about transferable utility matching. Um, and so this is a model of actually constructing how do you, con you know, the, an equilibrium construction of a network, okay? And I'm gonna talk about workers and firms because it's convenient vocabulary, but in fact, um, people have used this model to talk about many different kinds of things, inclu including, including marriages, for example, where there are intercouple transfers 
okay? And, and you can imagine other applications as well, okay? Um, and so this is an introduction to talking about, about one model of, 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 of uh, strategic matching. And I'm gonna actually do all this by talking about linear programming. Um, and uh, you probably don't remember very much about linear programming. Um, I have a wonderful set of lecture notes on linear programming. If you send me an email, I'll send them to you. Um, linear programming is really very important for a lot of things in economics, right? Um, is there anyone in the room who's interested in mechanism design, perchance? No, oh, kind of, a few hands. Yeah, but everyone's really shy about it. Like, I'm interested in mechanism design, but I won't admit it in this room because my status will go down because I think everybody else is a labor economist, right? Okay. Um, so Ricky Vora has a wonderful book, um, an econometric society mon monograph, which is, which is mechanism design all done through um, linear programming. And it's really about uh, how you can do everything by modeling in, in mechanism design by modeling it as a network flow problem. It's a fun book to read. It is kind of like the hard way to do almost anything. But yes, you can do it that way. Um, it's true. Um, so we're going to have workers and firms. And um, is this the beginning? Uh, no, it's not. Um, I'm going the wrong way, okay. Okay. Um, so we're gonna assume that we have uh, 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 two sets of objects, X and Y, say workers and firms, and we're gonna assume that there are more firms than workers, just for convenience. And you know what a match is? It's a one-to-one -one match where um, uh, worker X gets matched to firm Y. Um, and a match is gonna be stable, um, uh, if there are no pairs uh, x, y, and x prime, y prime, such that um, uh, x wants to leave his partner to match with y prime, and y prime wants to leave his partner to match with x, okay? Um, and um, so this is exactly the definition of stability that Scott was talking about yesterday, okay? Um, so um, because we have transferable utility, we can characterize Pareto optimality just by summing utility summing the value of the matches. I should say that every match, I didn't say that here. Um, so let me describe the setup of the problem. I'm, I'm missing a slide here. Um, that to every match uh, L of worker L and firm F, there is a payoff VLF, and I'll assume it's greater than or equal to zero to keep things simple for today. And, um, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and that we can think of as the surplus of the match, okay? And that surplus, at the end of the day, we want to divide somehow between workers and firms, okay? And the total surplus, and, 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 and so the, and since we're going to divide it, the optimus, and because we have transferable utility, we just want to max, we find Pareto optima by maximizing the sum of utilities, which means we want to maximize the total surplus. So we'll let XLF be equal to one if there's a match, zero otherwise. And here is, an, in, here is a linear programming problem. Suppose instead that we had an integer programming problem where we just said that XLF has to equal either 0 or 1. Right? If we did that, this is exactly the problem of finding, finding the uh, optimal match. Okay? Now I'm going to say, well, gee, it's hard to solve integer programming problems, so I'm going to let X and uh, uh, all the, the X variables be any number I want that's greater than or equal to 0. Okay? Um, now, if you look at these inequalities, they define some kind of convex object now in a Euclidean space. And a theorem which makes this whole analysis possible is that the vertices, there are two theorems. Number one, that the vertices of this convex object are in fact integer matches. Their x's where their x vectors where each, each component is either zero or one, namely it's a matching. Okay, and the second thing um, about them, uh, the fact we need to know is that if a linear program has an optimal solution, then it has an optimal vertex solution, all right? Um, and this is an elementary fact of linear programming, and I'm not going to, you know, explain why, but if you think about what a lin maximizing a linear function on a linear shape would have to be, would look like, you can see that, gee, that would have to be true. You could have this picture, right? Or you could have this picture, and you have two vertex optimal matches, but you're always going to have at least one. And so solving this linear program will give us an optimal match. Now, um, um, if, we, if we look at, I'm going to talk very quickly because I'm really out of time, OK? Um, we have two sets of constraints. We have a, a, a labor constraint, which says that every worker can be matched to at most one firm, right? 
And we have a firm constraint that says that every, every worker, uh, every firm gets matched to at most one worker. Okay? So in a linear program, we're going to have dual variables for each one of those constraints. The dual variables we will call the wage payment to worker L, right? The dual variable for the labor constraint. For the firm constraints, the dual variables, dual variables we'll call pi f, okay? Um, and, um, uh, and those are the profits to the firms, okay? Um, now the dual variable, uh, so this linear program problem, like all you know about duality because you studied this in consumer theory, right? Um, think about expenditure minimization versus utility maximization. Every linear program has a dual. That, linear, that dual is itself a linear program. And I have written down what the dual is, okay? Um, and any of you who remember linear programming or can look it up in the, some old textbook will recognize that this is correct. And the dual problem is to minimize this, um, the sum of all of these side payments subject to the constraint um, that um, for every LF pair, uh, pi F plus WL exceeds or is at least as big as the value of that match. And again, everything is non-negative. Um, now, um, there's a couple of facts that come out of this, okay? Number one, um, uh, there is a theorem of linear programming that says that the value of the dual problem and the value of the primal problem are the same. This means that the sum of the WLs plus the pi Fs has to equal the sum of the values of the match, okay? So we get, if we find an optimal match and then we look at a solution to the dual problem, the, val the sum of the dual variables will equal the value of the primal problem. That is to say that we are distributing all of the surplus, okay? That, that all the surplus, we, the surplus from any match is either, uh, um, and furthermore, because of the second constraint here, that the surplus for each match, for, for, any, any, w, for any FL pair, the sum of the payments has to be at least as big as the surplus. What that's going to say is that um, uh, for a match that actually happens, pi F plus WL will equal VLF. This property is called complementary slackness. Okay? Um, and uh, that means that the surplus is being split. And I'm almost done. Um, um, it is easy to see from this. And I'm not, I would talk through it if we had the time, but I won't take it. But a matching is stable if and only if it's optimal. Okay, this is in contrast to what happens with um, the matching that Scott was talking about yesterday. Remember where you could get one-sided optimality but not both-sided optimality? And that's because of the side payments. Um, uh, okay, um, I guess I don't have time to talk about that, so I won't. Um, um, what I want to say is that this idea of, of, of matching um, has been generalized to talk about structure of um, networks more generally, okay? Um, so um, let's think about the idea of stability, which says, go, let's go back to school choice because you heard so much about it yesterday. Um, no, there is, there is no school student pair where, a, um, uh, from, from a, a, where the student is not in the school and the school wants to get rid of a student so they can take in this student and the student wants to leave his school to go to this school, right? Okay. Um, we can kind of generalize that property and that property was generalized by Matt Jackson and Asher Walensky as follows. We can imagine having a network. Everybody has a utility function over the entire network, right? Some networks are better than other networks. And here is uh, a definition of stability which is gonna sound a lot like what you just heard, okay? Um, um, no individual wants to drop any of his links, okay? And there is no unlinked pair that would like to add an edge to the graph. So if I'm, if I, if I'm linked to you, I don't want to change the graph by getting rid of you, that will make me worse off, okay? On the other hand, if you and I are not linked and I want to add you, then you don't want to add me. And I'm hurt, okay? Uh, but so it is, okay? So um, uh, uh, this sounds a lot like the stability that we just heard, okay? Um, it's motivated by it. Um, uh, there are some difficulties with this concept. 
Uh, it sounds very Nash-like, doesn't it? Because everybody's thinking about their own deviations or at most a deviation with a pair, right? That, that uh, um, I don't want to drop a link, okay? That's independent of my thinking about, well, maybe you're going to change your links, okay? So it's kind of Nash-like in that way. It's not quite Nash-like in that, in, that, in that when I think about adding links, it's really the two of us thinking about adding a link, okay? Um, but nonetheless, um, uh, uh, it, has, it has a bit of a Nash-like feeling. Um, uh, and uh, so um, this is uh, uh, the justification for this. One justification for this actually comes out of cooperative game theory. It's kind of core-like. And so if you know what the core is, you can think about that phrase. Otherwise, leave it alone. Um, the other thing is, I think, and this is what maybe makes the most sense, is that we don't really know how to write down network formation games because they're very complex. Who knows what the strategy space is, right? But at the end of the day, we ought to see an outcome that looks something like what I've just described. Right? If the mechanism for forming a, um, a network is not stupid, then at the end of the day, it ought to have these properties, right? um, that you don't end up with a link that you don't want. You should just get rid of it if you do. Right? Um, and um, uh, and uh, so this is, um, you know, there is now a burgeoning business in econometrics of looking at networks and trying to estimate utility functions for networks under the assumption right, that the network that you're looking at is stable. There have been a number of theses um, from theoretical econometricians in the last several years, four or five years, that are doing this kind of thing, looking, studying network formation this way. There is one problem with this, and that is that, that, that for not all utility functions do stable matches exist, okay? And, um, uh, and so clearly one needs to do something else in this dimension, and this is, um, kind of an open problem, um, and I will, I will leave you with that. Um, there's a lot in my notes that I've not covered at all. I have extensive notes in here about, about diffusion of, 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 about social learn. I have notes on learning in networks, um, which was really kind of each one is, each, that topic alone is like an hour's conversation. I have notes about, about diffusion of strategies in a, in a network, right? So we might imagine playing a coordination game on a network. What do equilibria look like? Um, um, when does a strategy take over um, uh, a network? So I have, I have uh, uh, discussions about this. You should, these notes will be posted, but actually more to the point. You can look at last year's notes online, um, and you can talk to me. I'm happy to talk about this stuff in office hours, because having given you a taste for what you can do with networks and how you can think about them, I am now stopping at exactly the moment where I want to start talking. And I would continue to go on, but someone over there is ready to kill me. <laughs> so we're going to stop now. And I know that uh, lunch is waiting. So thank you very much. <laughs>